is Eddie, and I have lived with psychosis for most of my life. To me, psychosis means living in a different reality. Uh, a reality that isn't shared with other people. Often living with psychosis is dark and miserable. While experiencing psychosis, I've got to hear the voice of God, the opposite, uh, seen and spoken with angels, and been to hell itself. Recovery College and peer support really did turn my life around. I thought I would never get better, and yet here I am. The things that Senua experiences in our blaze are very similar to some of our own experiences. She lives in a reality that other people might find hard to understand. She sees significance in symbols, in meeting people, in all sorts of things that are going on around her. Senua is experiencing an altered state of reality which would be very hard to understand without having experienced it yourself or playing Hellblade. It's difficult saying that it's uh, an illness, that it's not real. Of course to me it is, and of course to Senua it is, and that's what's driving her to do these amazing feats of courage to overcome pain and exhaustion to do what she knows she must. The way that Hellblade has captured the experience of psychosis is nothing like I've ever seen before in terms of its realism, in terms of its uh, fairness to people like me. The transformative effect of recovery colleges is the fact that we embrace everybody for who they are. We look at what they can do, we look at their strengths, and we look to normalise any of those additional challenges to ensure that people can not only live well, but thrive within their communities. The impact of stigmatising attitudes and behaviours is vast. There's a sense of isolation and shame that you feel, and feeling very, very different from your peers. I also know personally that it stopped me from seeking treatment at an earlier opportunity. One of the main ways that we can reduce stigma within our communities is to talk about our normal experiences. The more we can normalise and demystify what is happening to each and every one of us, the more it feels safe for us to be able to be who we are. Another way that we can combat stigma is by holding events such as this. I think by utilising people with real life lived experience, you are hearing from the true sense of self around how it feels. You are also learning about the things that we can do as well as the things that we maybe struggle with. Hello everyone and welcome to Hellblade, A Journey of the Mind. Uh, my name is Don Matthews and I'm the studio head at Ninja Theory. We're the video game developers of the games Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice and Senua's Saga, Hellblade 2. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, whether you're here in Cambridge with us or whether you are watching uh, from home online. The video you just saw is really what today is all about. We heard from Eddie and from Emma about the experience of and the stigma attached to psychosis. And today is an opportunity to share and discuss how, over the past 10 years, a collaboration between us, a video game development studio, experts in neuroscience, and those with lived experience, has attempted to bring to life in a video game what it can be like to live with psychosis. Today we'll hear from, among others, Professor Paul Fletcher, a professor of health neuroscience here at University of Cambridge, on his perspective of our collaboration. From Eddie and from Emma, from RCE Wellbeing Hub, part of Cambridge and Peterborough NHS Foundation Trust, and from members of the Hellblade development team. 
At Ninja Theory, in our 24-year history, we have often created games that explore fantasy worlds. In 2013, we decided that for our next game, we again wanted to explore a fantasy experience, but this fantasy to be the creation of our protagonist's mind. As someone who sees and experiences the world differently from others. Our story was to be that of Senua, a Celtic warrior who, after experiencing a life full of trauma, is led on a vision quest to save the soul of her lover from Viking hell. A video game focused on our studio's mission of crafting life-changing art with game-changing tech. On embarking on this new project, we knew we had to take our research and our understanding seriously if we were to achieve a game that would first and foremost be compelling for our players to play, but at the same time give a truthful representation of psychosis. And to give our players a sense of what it could be like to exist in an unshared reality. Hearing things that others don't, seeing things that others don't, and having unique beliefs about the world. And so, over 10 years ago, we began our collaboration with Paul at first to understand how we all come to experience reality and how that can result in a unique experience for some. And what started off as an exercise in ensuring our repre representations would be truthful turned into a creative collaboration where not only our representations were accurate but so creatively rich too, leading to an unforgettable journey for our players. Through Paul and a collaboration with the Wellcome Trust, we had the opportunity to work with people with experience of psychosis and to understand what it can be really like. And although there are common themes, to understand that everyone's experiences are unique. Over the past decade, we've had the great privilege to spend time with our mental health collaborators. And it has often struck me just how profoundly impactful our collaboration has been for me, for our team at Ninja Theory, and of course for our players. And so as we place the finishing touches on Senua Saga Hellblade 2 to be released on May the 21st, I wanted to give you all an opportunity to hear some of the things I've heard, to hear from Paul and from Eddie and from Emma, and to understand a little more how our team at Ninja Theory has worked really hard to listen, to understand, and to integrate our learnings into the life and stories of Senua. When we released Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice in 2017, we did so knowing we were treading new ground for video games and attempting to reverse the tide of what had unfortunately been years of poor representation of mental health in games. Through our collaboration, I'm pleased to say that not only was the game critically well received, winning numerous awards, but it's been held up as somewhat of a triumph in the representation of lived experience with the game having gone on to be used in academic teaching and being the subject of a number of published papers. Of all the recognition we received for Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, the most important recognition was for the perceived impact beyond the game experience. This included a BAFTA Award for Games Beyond Entertainment and the Royal College of Psychiatrists Award for Communicator of the Year. The most touching and most powerful impact, however, was that felt by our players, many of whom contacted us directly to tell us how Senua and her story had impacted them. People who, for the first time, had a language with which to speak about their own experiences. People who, for the first time, were inspired to seek clinical support. And people who could now understand the lives of their loved ones by way of understanding Senua's story. As we approach the release of Senua Saga, Hellblade 2, it is at the forefront of our minds that our priority is to deliver the next step of Senua's journey in a truthful way. In Senua's sacrifice, we found an isolated person experiencing her difficulties for the very first time, understanding them for the first time, and ultimately coming to a point of acceptance of both her trauma and her visions and her voices. In Hellblade 2, we take Senua on a new journey. One where she has a different balance of power, 
where she is no longer a victim to her experiences. But her experiences are just as strong. And for the first time, we are seeing Senua's unique model of the world coming into contact with that of others, and at times clashing with the model of other people. This has been a challenge for us and for Senua, exploring areas such as what it is like to manage internal chatter with a conversation with another person. I'd like to take today as an opportunity to say thank you to Paul, to Eddie, to Emma, and to all of our collaborators, past and present. As we look ahead to the next chapter of Senua's story, our ambition is that we continue her journey and her mental journey in a way that both entertains our players and gives them an opportunity, even just for a short while, to step into the shoes of someone who experiences psychosis. So following me, we'll hear from Professor Paul Fletcher, after which there'll be an opportunity for questions both in the room and online. We'll have a short break returning at 3.40 for a panel discussion, again followed by some questions. Paul will be hosting our panel today, and our pan panellists will be Emma and Eddie, uh, Professor Matthew Broom from the University of Birmingham, and Lara and Mark from the Ninja Theory development team. Um, for those of us in the building, we'll have a drinks reception at 5.30. For questions uh, in the room, if you just raise your hand, we can bring a microphone to you. And if you're watching online, uh, you can uh, post your questions in the chat and we'll try and get to as many as we possibly can. Finally, we've partnered with two charities for today's event, uh, and they are Rethink Mental Illness here in the UK and Mental Health America in the US. There are details in the description of whichever platform you're watching on if you'd like to make a donation. Both of these charities also have excellent resources if you'd like to find out more about the subjects that we're talking today. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Uh, I hope you enjoy the discussions, and I'll hand over to Professor Paul Fletcher. Thank you very much, Don. Um, and thanks to all the organisers of this, including uh, Dr. Dervla Glynn from Cambridge Neuroscience, who's always a big part of events like this. And it's very proud of, uh, we feel very proud that Cambridge Neuroscience is is collaborating with Ninja Theory in this event. So Dom has asked me to talk about the Hellblade process from the clinical neuroscience perspective, and I'm really delighted and privileged to do that. But at the same time, I do want to emphasize that my own part in this is a, a very small part of a big team, and it's been a, a joy and a privilege. But at the same time, although I'm getting a lot of time to talk to you, um, it's just one small part, and we're going to hear over the course of the afternoon what those other parts were. And that includes the voice of lived experience, which is absolutely core. So what I'd like to emerge over the course of this 45-minute or so presentation is a, a series of themes um, that I'll be touching on as I go through. And the first of those is really about the question of why... Um, psychiatry and neuroscience would be interested in partnering with video games. What's an old professor like me doing with cool people in the video game industry? I'd like to also talk about um, psychosis itself and provide a clinical perspective on that. It's just one perspective, but it's an important one nonetheless. And to do that, I think we need to also step back and ask questions about everyday functioning of the brain and the mind as it navigates this complex reality, this complex world that it has to get through. And finally, I want to um, describe with some pride how um, art, science and lived experience can come together in this synergistic way. And in many ways, that's a prelude to the panel discussion, which includes the voices of lived experience, of narrative, auditory and visual art, and also um, of Matthew Broom, a psychiatrist who has put a lot of work into trying to understand the complexity and the experience of psychosis. So in many ways, you can see me as the sort of nutritious broccoli and sprouts that you have to put up with before we can get on to the lavish, multi-layered dessert, which is the panel discussion. So I'm, excuse me, I'm, uh, uh, I, st I trained in medicine originally and became very interested in psychiatry at an early stage. 
and practiced clinically until I was about 30. I had no real interest in, um, in research, but somehow I found myself doing research at some point. And my research really mirrored my clinical interests, which was about how the human brain comprehends or apprehends this complex and changing reality, which is the world around it. And more than that, how that, the processes involved in that comprehension can change so that somebody can experience a psychosis. Now, psychosis is clinically used as a quite a loose descriptive term. It refers to a loss of contact with reality, or more accurately, I think, the experience of an unshared reality. As Don said, somebody might experience perceptions that are very vivid, but that aren't agreed to by people around uh, the person. So they're perceptions of things that are generally held not to be there, and also beliefs that might uh, be entirely out of keeping with what a person uh, or what the people around you are experiencing. A good example of psychosis comes in the description from Catherine Cho. I'd, I'd certainly recommend her book, Inferno, about her experience of a postpartum psychosis after she'd given birth to her son, Cato. And she described it in an Observer column uh, published in 2020. I went to feed Cato but noticed that my hands were clutching him tightly. Would I suffocate him? His eyes darted, looking at me with fear. And then it happened. His eyes were devil's eyes, dark eyes with flashing red pupils. I slept, but the next moment my eyes were open and I heard a voice. It was a voice in my head, but it spoke with clarity and strength. Each time it spoke, the room filled with light. Somehow I knew it was the voice of God. Your son needs to die. The voice was simple, straightforward. A very powerful, deeply disturbing experience that she describes. And it's important to remember that... This experience is not some pale, imaginary one. It's a vivid and hard reality, just as we all feel that we're directly in contact with the reality around us. It feels real. And this echoes the words that Eddie, um, Eddie uh, articulated in the opening video. More than that, psychosis is associated with profound stigma and isolation. And this is really absolutely key. For the large part, we're social animals. We experience our world, we experience ourselves through shared social constructs and values, through shared beliefs, through shared culture. And to experience a reality that doesn't accord with that of those around you is to become dislocated from them in many ways. And their response to that can be one of bewilderment or frustration, Fear, potentially, aggression, even anger. And the question arises, what can we, as a community, do about this stigmatisation of this condition or of this, of this experience? And I think one thing we can do is to listen to the stories of people with psychosis. Mira Sayal very deservedly received uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award last year from the British Academy of Film and Television. She did many things to deserve this award. I think she's absolutely brilliant. And she opened her acceptance speech with the following words. She said, when we listen to someone's story, we step into their shoes. They're no longer a stranger, another, a statistic. They're as complex and human as we are. And that's a central principle to everything that this whole event and this whole process has been about. I also quite like the words of Tolstoy in thinking about conveying, um, conveying experience through art. The activity of art is based on the fact that man, receiving his sense of hearing or sight, another man's expression of feeling, is capable of experiencing the emotion which moved the man who expressed it. This resonates a lot with uh, Philip Larkin's idea about how poetry works as a distillation in which the writer is able to create through words the same experience, emotion, feeling in the reader as they were feeling when they wrote those words. Um, Chekhov remarked that an artist's flair is sometimes worth a scientist's brain. While I wouldn't argue with any of Mira Sayal's word, I would take issue with a number of things in both of these quotes. Firstly, I would replace in Chekhov's quote the word sometimes with the word always. Secondly, I would remove the obsolete 
gendered language from Tolstoy's quote. But I would also point out that Tolstoy seemed to express the notion of art as a rather passive, receptive experience. And one wonders what Tolstoy would have made of the video game experience in which the person is an active participant in the story, which I think is absolutely crucial. And that was something that I'd been thinking about for quite some time. Uh, when, in 2014, quite out of the blue, I received an email from Dom inviting me to visit him and Tamim Antoniades and to get involved in what became Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice. So they were pushing at an open door because I really had already felt that video games had a huge amount to offer. So if you hold that thought, I'm going to get back to reality and the brain for a little while. So I believe that the fundamental challenge that is posed to the human brain in making sense of reality is very nicely articulated by the Nobel laureate uh, Vernon Mountcastle, who said, each of us lives within the universe or the prison of their own brain, projecting from it millions of fragile sensory nerve endings arranged in groups uniquely adapted to sample energy states. Heat, light, force, chemical composition, that's all we can know of it directly. Everything else is pure inference. Now, what I think, the way I interpret Mount Castle's uh, perspective here, this is Fletcher art, not ninja theory art, I hate to turn. <laughs> every, every time I show my slides at, at the Ninja Theory Studios, I can see that the artists are far too courteous to say it, but I, I, I feel them wince. <laughs> so we have a, a sense, an experience, that our brain is um, directly in contact with the world. It's a very low-flying plane is directly in contact with the world, but in reality, it's imprisoned within the cranial vault. Never... So I'm, I'm pausing because I've never heard a plane that low before. Um, it's imprisoned within the cranial vault, and it's through the holes in the cranial vault that the nerve endings are sending their electrical signals, little binary signals that are coming with immense complexity from all different directions, rapid, complex, ambiguous, difficult to decipher. And it is out of that raw material that the brain needs to construct its picture of the reality around it. That's what the challenge is. And these are so ambiguous and so intensive that there's no way the brain can do that in any simple, receptive manner. It has to bring to bear what we already know. There are two important implications. The first is the signals are not enough. We need some sort of scaffold in which to, around which to assemble our construction of reality. Um, and that scaffold is made up of our prior knowledge and experience. So what we're predicting, what our prior knowledge is predicting, and what the world is signalling have to come together and exist in a balance. It's not all what the world is telling us, it's what we're bringing to the, um, to the equation too. And it's a very delicate balance and it can be easily shifted. And one thing that experimentalists like myself and my colleagues like doing is to prod that system and see what happens. I remember when I first started in research being very fascinated learning about something called binocular rivalry. Now, most of us are seeing the world through two eyes, um, and we don't see two worlds, even though the perspective of each eye is slightly different. We see one world that we've somehow integrated from those two sources of visual information. What happens if you set up this little apparatus that shows one image to one eye and one image to another? So say a, ha a, a face to the left eye and a house to the right eye. My initial instinct was that what you'd see is some sort of weird mess that was bits of house and bits of face. Actually, what you see is either a face or a house. The system will not let you see this mashup because it's not in keeping with what your predictions would be. Um, you might argue, well, actually, it's just one eye becoming dominant and then the other. But if you, if you do this, if you present half a face and half a house to one eye and half of the other half of the face and the other half of the house to the other eye, you see either a face or a house. Your system will not let you see something that is so unpredictable or counterintuitive as a face house or a house face. So binocular rivalry is telling you that there's an awful lot going on below the radar of consciousness. You're doing a lot of work in constructing your reality. 
And you can play around with that. I mean, I don't know if any of you have come across the famous f floating finger illusion where you place your fingers about a centimetre apart and focus on them and then look into the distance and you will see between those two fingers a little floating finger because you're preventing that integration by changing the perspective of the two eyes. You're, I note you're all resisting the tendency to try and do that. Do, do, do feel free. There's also the, the classic Aristotle illusion um, where normally if you experience uh, a, a tactile sensation on one side of the index finger and another tactile sensation on the opposite side of the middle finger, that would be consistent with there being two objects. But if you cross your fingers and rub your nose, it feels like you've got two noses. The system is, is struggling to integrate that sort of experience. Now, it's not just um, within the sensory domain that this integration is occurring. We're also very good at integrating across sensory domains. And many of you will be familiar with the classic McGurk effect. But I'm, for those who aren't, I'm just going to play it for you now. So if you listen to what this man is saying... Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 ba. So that sounds like va, 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 va. If... You hear the same sound, but he's actually making different movements with his lips. It will sound different. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 ba. So by and large, people will hear that as ba. Now, you may think I've been playing a trick on you and I'm playing two different, two different sounds, but actually, if you just... If I show both faces at the same time, and if you look at one and then switch your attention to the other, you'll actually hear the sound change as you do so. So I'll encourage you to do that, just to ba, convince yourself. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 ba. I hope that's convincing. So what you're seeing um, is actually determining how you're interpreting this slightly ambiguous auditory I experience. It's all part of the integration, the constructive process. We also use past experience to disambiguate, to, um, to, to make sense of sounds. So I'll just play, you, whoops, just play you this sound, if I can. So many of you might have heard that before if you've seen me speak. I'm a bit repetitive, I must say. But if you haven't, that might just sound like meaningless clockwork birdie song type sound. But now I'm going to give you some experience, some knowledge. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. So now you should find that you effortlessly integrate that knowledge into the previous sound. <coughs> so having that prior experience, you can effortlessly now decipher what was in the noisy speech that, that you first heard. And you might just need a small amount of extra sensory information in order to make sense of something that is otherwise um, ambiguous. So a little bit of extra visual input changes the whole context of that experience. We also use what's going on around. So, for example, the surrounding words in a sentence to, to make sense or to disambiguate relatively ambiguous visual input. So most people would read this, I imagine, as Jack and Jill went up the hill. Happy with that? And most people would read this as the last event was cancelled. Um, actually, the, the stimuli here, went and event, are identical. So what determined how effortlessly you read it was the context of the sentence. We also do this with people's mental states or what we perceive other people's mental states to be. So um, this handsome devil is... Ivan Muzhukin, a 1920s matinee idol. And the director, Kuleshov, um, took some film of Muzhukin looking into the camera. And he spliced it with a number of different other clips, including a dead body, a plate of soup, and a, a young woman. And he played these clips to audiences who were able to marvel at how subtly Muzhukin was able to express great grief when he saw the dead body or great hunger when he saw the soup or lust when he saw the young woman. The reality was that it was the same clip of film of Muzhukin in each case. What differed was what the audience thought he was looking at. So they were projecting their expectations 
about his mental state onto their interpretation of his um, facial expression, the so-called Kulyashov effect. So sometimes, as the last slide's shown, our, our predictions actually do create a slightly false sense of reality, one that um, may go wrong or may deviate from objective reality. Um, and we, we need some sort of protection about that uh, or from that. And our brains have something that they're very sensitive to, which is a so-called prediction error. When there's a mismatch between what we're predicting and what the actual input is. So this gives a good example, I think, of prediction error. Um, to most people looking at this, they would agree that what you see here is a little sort of pointed arch with some columns. But if something happens um, that violates your predictions, as you'll see here, sorry, I'm just... When you place a ball on the bottom, you wouldn't expect it to roll up the arch like that. So you need to uh, review your predictions, review your model of the world, if you like. One thing you might think is, well, it's, it's fixed. Those balls are magnetic or under control. But actually, the reality is that what you saw in the first place wasn't a pointed arch in the normal sense. It was actually an odd perspective on something very different. Now, strikingly for me, when you go back to that, it's still difficult not to see it as a pointed arch, even though you have had that experience of seeing what it actually is. And this is something that we refer to as a sort of cognitive impenetrability, the idea that you may cognitively know something is the case, but if your senses, your perceptions are telling you something different, it's very difficult to override that. And one of the most famous examples of that is the so-called hollow mask illusion, where we know that a mask has a hollow side, but because we have these inbuilt, probably hardwired predictions about the nature of facial features sticking out rather than sticking in, it's very difficult not to see that as an inverted or convex face, as, as you see the hollow side. Now, neuroscientists get very excited about ideas like this because what they can do is make them very, very complicated. <laughs> um, so there's been a lot of work in relating these basic ideas to the microcircuitry of the brain cortex and thinking about how it acts in different areas. And then people get very frisky and start putting these complex equations to mathematically model it. But the Fletcher version of that is this. I think this, keeping it at this simple level actually allows us to think very carefully about ways in which the system might be shifted, about ways in which the balance might be altered. So we have this basic idea that we have our predictions based on our prior knowledge and understanding of the world, and we have our incoming signals, and those exist in a balance. And... It, this balance is to some extent mediated by this very valuable signal, which is prediction error, our ability to acknowledge when our predictions are not being fulfilled. And so if that happens, then we need to either update our predictions or else ignore our incoming signals or reevaluate, resample the world. It's a great system. Most of the time, it works extremely well. Um, you saw that, for example, with the noisy speech. If you hear a little bit of um, clear speech, you can then disambiguate the noisy speech very easily. Or if you see the dorsal fin of the shark, you don't have to see the rest of the shark to know that it's time to swim in the opposite direction. It's a great, efficient way of dealing with the world. But, of course, it can be shifted. And I gave you some examples, so the floating finger illusion, the Aristotle illusion... Those are instances in which incoming signals might be altered and the system can slightly break down, it can slightly deviate and create something that's really a bit of um, uh, you know, unreality, such as this floating finger between your, between your two fingers. And it's very helpful to think about ways in which this system can be perturbed when we're starting to go on to think about people who experience altered realities. Because if we know it can happen under everyday circumstances, we can start to think about how it can happen in other ways. So one way it can happen is uh, we can just simply cut off the incoming signals. 
Sensory deprivation chamber is one way in which this is done, and it can very powerfully provoke hallucinatory experiences in anybody who spends any amount of time in a sensory deprivation chamber. Related to that is the uh, so-called uh, prisoner's cinema. People in solitary confinement within a short space of time will start to hallucinate vivid images on the wall in front of them because their sensory input has been, if you like, denuded or degraded. A consequence is there's an imbalance. There's more emphasis on the predictive part of the brain that is not being counteracted by reality checking through your input. Another example in the neurological world is a syndrome called Charles Bonnet syndrome. This occurs in people who are maybe losing their vision through macular degeneration, and they can start to experience really very vivid, um, compelling hallucinations of quite fantastic creatures. So there's a, there's a website for people in which people with Charles Bonnet syndrome give very powerful first-person accounts of their experiences. So I often see big cats like tigers and panthers, or I, I see miniature people moving from the right to the left, wearing strange outfits. Interestingly, because it's, it's one, the lower part of the system that is being, if you like, unbalanced, um, often they can develop an insight that although this thing in front of me seems very vivid, I know that it's not real. So they have that capacity to reject the evidence of their senses, even though they still have that evidence. Now, another thing, that, of course, that can change is our predictions. Um, I've already suggested with, say, the hollow mask illusion or the, the pointed arch that wasn't a pointed arch, is that if you have strong predictions based upon past experience, um, it's very difficult to avoid letting those act upon your incoming signals. But it's also the case that um, our predictions can be altered by experience, by individual variability. So some people might have a tendency to generally impose patterns on the world based on their predictions to a greater extent than others. And that can be advantageous. It might mean that they see patterns that other, people's don't, other people don't, but it also might mean that they might um, fabricate patterns that aren't objectively there. Stress is another way in which our predictions about the world change. If you're in a state of fear, you become vigilant, you start to look out for signs of danger. So walking down the street at night time is a very different experience to daytime when you might see a shape in the distance as much more threatening compared to uh, in broad daylight. Or um, if you have particular predictions about your relationships with other people, under stress, you may feel that laughter coming from a room is directed at you rather than being completely unrelated to you. It's a very interesting phenomenon that uh, I, I was at a talk by Anil Seth uh, on Friday, and he gave a, a great example of how powerfully predictions might shape our sensory experiences. So this is just done in a machine, a so-called uh, deep convolutional network, which is essentially a multi-layer little mini-brain I mean, it bears some relationship to brain processing, um, in which th the lower layers represent the sensory input and the higher layers are primarily there to interpret it. So, for example, they might be able to learn when there's a lot of dogness in a picture and say, this is a picture of a dog. So you can train that higher level to give the right answer over hundreds of thousands of images and eventually it'll be very good at saying when there's a dog. What Suzuki and Seth and team did was something very different from that. They fixed the top layer and said, essentially created a, a setting in which the top layer was convinced that somewhere in that picture was a dog. And they allowed the inputs to change in order to maximize the dogness in any particular image. So what you've got here is strong predictions from above shifting how the lower levels are acting. I've given a, a quite a broad description of that. Um, but this, this is essentially what the machine produced when presented with just some basic film of somewhere in Brighton, I think, in which the machine is convinced that there are dogs in there. And you can see it's continually working hard to try and find little bits of dog in everything it sees. Now, I'm not suggesting this is like psychosis. It could 
it could bear some resemblance to a hallucinogen or a psychedelic state. Um, but it's just interesting to see how, in a machine like this, making the predictions stronger and um, allowing the input to try and match the predictions rather than the other way around can produce a very powerful effect. But there are other much more um, pernicious examples of how a change in prediction can shift our experience of the world, and one of those is trauma. Trauma has been related to um, psychosis. In some people who've experienced psychosis, trauma can be a big part of that whole um, process. And one good example, of course, of trauma is uh, PTSD, or as it was known in the First World War, shell shock. And there are some really interesting examples uh, from the literature of people describing these altered perceptions of the world that arose from their battlefield trauma. So there's a brilliant trilogy of books by uh, Pat Barker in which he describes Siegfried Sassoon's experience with psychiatry during the war. And she uh, recreates a conversation that Sassoon had with his psychiatrist, Dr Rivers. Um, when I woke up, the nightmares didn't always stop. I used to see corpses, men with half their faces shot off, crawling across the floor. Wilfred Owen, who also experienced shell shock, um, when he was in what was then called Craig Lockhart Asylum in Scotland, on leave from the trenches, wrote a poem which he called Mental Cases, which presumably I always think was what was stamped on the file of some soldiers who suffered from uh, combat fatigue or shell shock. And very vividly, he brings to mind this idea of them re-experiencing the trauma of the battlefield and being unable to separate it from the present, presence because their predictions about the world have become so profoundly disrupted by that trauma that those predictions were now the lens through which they viewed the world. Always they must see these things and hear them. A very powerful poem made all the more poignant by the fact that it was written only a few weeks before he returned to the trenches and was killed. So I've looked at this idea of altered incoming signals and uh, altered predictions and, of course, individual variability in prediction. These are concepts that allow us to think about the system changing, but we can also think about the message passing in the system changing. So this is instantiated or enacted within a very complex piece of wet machinery, the brain, in which there's a whole soup of neurochemicals interacting with each other to determine the message passing across neurons, across synapses. And there are many ways in which that can be altered. Um, stress, sleep deprivation. We saw the quote from Catherine Cho, a woman who was experiencing a profound life event, but also an enormous physiological hormonal upheaval arising from pregnancy and then childbirth. We also see it, and I've been very struck by it, in delirium in the hospital when somebody is maybe post-operative or in cases where perhaps they are experiencing delirium tremens when they're withdrawing from alcohol. And there's some great examples in the literature of people describing delirium tremens. So Charles Dickens in the Pickwick Papers wrote of a man, an unfortunate man who had stopped drinking and his experience was of insects, hideous crawling things with eyes that stared upon him and filled the very air around, glistening horribly amidst the thick darkness of the place. The walls and ceilings were alive with reptiles. The vault expanded to an enormous size. Frightful figures flitted to and fro, and the faces of men he knew peered out from among them. Horribly powerful experience, and one that um, also resonates with Emil Zola's description of uh, withdrawal from absence in, in Coupeau, in La Samoire. So spiders' webs all over the walls, as big as ship sails. Then the webs turned into nets with meshes that got larger and smaller. Black balls popped in and out of the meshes. It's so horribly confusing experiences, changing rapidly, often filled with um, fearful images. But delirium tends to be quite fluctuating, and there's not much in the way of a story to it. Um, it's something that somebody is, if you like, almost confabulating at the time. 
because their brain is in such a state of confusion. But more serious uh, mental illness that we see in psychiatry is usually associated with much more established experiences, one that can go on for weeks or months or years and that have a, a consistency and a cohesion. Um, these are just some first-person examples that I've taken from, um, from uh, a journal that invites and publishes first-person accounts from people. So Jason Jepson wrote, Sometimes I hear voices at night before I go to bed. The voice might be telling me that there's someone outside my front door or there's someone messing with my car in the parking lot. Bethany Eiser described hearing voices, a choir of children's voices in my mind, and the voices called me a homeless hoodlum repeatedly and insulted me. A few days later, while showering, I heard three obnoxious men making fun of me. Because of the nature of their comments, I knew the men could see me in the bathroom, but when I looked, there was no window or sunroof. The men were not there. These are much more long-lasting experiences and very, very powerful ones in which, which essentially constitutes these people's reality. So in short, what I've said is that I believe, and I'm not alone in believing this, our, our experience of reality is largely constructed. It's based on our predictions and our expectations. And this is good. It endows us with very powerful and efficient apparatus that can help us to make sense of a world that is, after all, rapid, ambiguous, noisy, unreliable. It helps us to get through this... Um, it helps us to make sense of these um, neural signals that are would otherwise be completely incoherent. But we pay a price for using this system, and that price is that there's always there this vulnerability to deviating from what is an objective reality. That's the case with all of us. And there are therefore many routes, I believe, to the experience of psychosis. So one thing I would say is it's very unwise to make any sweeping generalizations. If anyone tells you that they know the cause of psychosis, um, <laughs> I would take that with a, a large pinch of salt. There are many, many routes by which somebody can have an altered experience of reality. One thing we should remember, though, is that that experience of reality is a real experience. Um, it's not neural noise. It's not just something that flitters about in the neural machinery of the brain. It is part of their attempt to make sense of the world. And as such, it needs to be treated with respect of the narrative that they're conferring upon it. And the other thing that's common across psychosis is stigma and its tendency to lead to isolation. And that is absolutely key. Many of the, my experiences in clinical work have been that what the person suffers from more than the content of their experiences is the effect of those experiences on their relationship with others around them, including loved ones. And that brings us back to the idea of stigma and video games. So there was a theme developing. Now, as I said, I already had a, an enthusiasm about the participatory nature, the agency that's entailed in hearing a story and being part of a story through video games. And there are many things since then that I've really felt have been extraordinarily powerful about the game art form or medium. Firstly, uh, the player is exploring and comprehending a new ambiguous world. When the person picks up that controller or boots up their PC, they're agreeing to make sense of a world that may be novel to them. And I think that challenge of making sense of this world mirrors the challenges that are faced in all of us making sense of the real world. Obviously, for gameplay, the setting is absorbing and motivating and immersive, otherwise it's not a successful game. And that can be a powerful part of the storytelling too. But it's an active, unlike Tolstoy's description of art, this is an active and very participatory medium. You share the experiences of the protagonist. The boundaries between you and that protagonist become blurred and am ambiguous. You may find yourself saying, uh, why did I do that? Or why did you do that? Or why are we doing this? Um, this is something that Emma Ray, who's made a lot of studies of video games, really conveyed to me. And it's certainly my experience of playing games is this very ambiguous experience of agency and of the player, of, of the protagonist. 
And of course, choice, action and learning are key parts of the experience. And I think anything that involves that is going to uh, have a powerful impact on how you experience the character and how you empathise with them. And it was in an article um, just before the release of Hellblade that I, I speculated, um, and, and this is the content of what I was saying, might not all of these attributes confer the potential for establishing a really remarkable relationship between the character and the player? And in doing so, could it enable more ambitious representations of mental illness, perhaps even engendering a very powerful sense of empathy? But at the same time, and this is something that Dom alluded to earlier, um, his, the, the, the history of video games is not without its blots in terms of mental state representation. There's a very interesting article by Patrick Lindsay published online in 2014 in which he complained that gaming's favourite villain is mental illness and it needs to stop. Shapiro and Rotter in 2016, um, actually that's Rota, there should be an umlaut over the O, um, reviewed best-selling games from 2011 to 2013 and unforgivably 42 characters were identified as portraying mental illness with the majority being fitted into the category of homicidal maniac. Seth Macy argued in 2015 that insanity is a great trope, really. You can use it to motivate evil. This person is mad, therefore they do this. Totally out of keeping with the reality of mental illness, but something that is easy to fall into in designing a story. Lindsay, going back to his article, I think he made some really key points. He said that the types of portrayals that we were getting at this time, up to 2014, actually discourages any sort of conversation or understanding. Uh, portraying people with mental illness as broken, defective or otherwise different. Um, this lack of conversation creates an atmosphere in which mental health issues and the people who live with them are stigmatised and made to feel like outsiders, unable to address their concerns with families, friends and co-workers. We aren't being encouraged to understand and empathise with mental illness, we're being taught to fear it. And he made the key point, developers need to start with a person and work outwards, not start with the symptoms and then add a little bit of a person inside that collection of symptoms. And it was that really that I saw time and again in the way that Ninja Theory approached the making of the original Hellblade. This was the original idea, um, I think in 2014, about what the basic story would be. And at that time, uh, I became involved in the conversation and, and uh, you know, it became an incredibly rewarding experience and a privilege to be part of that conversation. It involved initially um, a particular practice. We had presentations and discussions. Most of Ninja Theory have seen most of my slides several times before, so thank you for keeping your eyes open. We discussed the neuroscience, we discussed the clinical experiences, but crucially there was early involvement of people who had that lived experience themselves. And this was facilitated uh, through a, a really great interaction with Ian Dodgen at the Wellcome Trust. The principles were always of openness. Ninja Theory didn't hide the fact that this was what they were working on. They invited comments from the community and responded to those. And the actual collaboration wasn't about tokenism. It wasn't bringing people in and giving them a tour and sending them on their way. It was about listening to what they had to say. And I hope we'll get a sense of that, too, in the panel discussion. And there were rules that were unwritten but were there all the time. Be accurate, but don't try and generalise. This, this isn't a character to represent mental illness. This is a person with a story who happens to have these experiences. Be sensitive but not soft. I recall one of the people um, contributing their lived experience arguing very strongly early on that there couldn't be any Disneyfication of uh, the experience. Senna was a person, not a mental illness, not a chick checkbox of things that we can, uh, sort of perceptual pyrotechnics that we can amaze people with. It was a person with experiences. And she was a hero, <coughs> is a hero, not a victim. The collaboration, I think, is nicely summed up by this picture in which we have Francesca, me, Tamim, uh, Ian Dodge and me, and four people from Recovery College, Michael, Tracy, Cathy and Jen, who were all part of that, watching the whole gameplay several weeks before it was released and making comments, comments that were listened to. And as 
Dom said, it was a commercial and critical success, and that was enormously rewarding. And, and you know, quite a <laughs> hadn't really been on my bucket list to stand behind Dom as he gave a BAFTA acceptance speech. But you know, <laughs> who knows where your career will take you? Um, and in addition, it's been treated seriously by the scientific community. Um, papers have come out, I won't go into the details, exploring the impact of Senua's sacrifice. And I personally have used a lot of the assets from the game in my teaching, and I've made them available through Ninja Theory to other people who find them very useful in trying to depict the experiences of psychosis. But most important of all were the things that people were saying to us about what it meant to them, people who'd played it or who had relatives who'd played it. I received... This was the first message I personally received after the release of the game. Um, and... I, I knew when I received it, I thought, well, I'll treasure this. I didn't realise that there would be other messages. And if you stay around till the very end, you'll see some depictions of those messages. Um, and I would urge you to do so, because they were so powerful and so important about the impact that the game had had. And so now it's on to Hellblade 2. And I'm not going to give any spoilers or anything, but I will say that uh, this is something we're going to take up in the panel discussion. Um, Certainly, there are some very interesting changes in Senua's experience. And one thing that's going to happen is that she is now amongst other people. Hellblade 1 was a very solitary experience in which she was enveloped by this darkness, fighting her way through it. In Hellblade 2, she is with others. She encompasses their reality into her worldview, and her reality becomes a part of theirs. This notion of a dual reality is something that's very interesting, I think. And so I'd like to leave it there and invite questions. But in closing, there's one thing I do want to mention, which was somebody who's a huge part of Hellblade 1, Jane Essen, who um, was a, really a ray of sunshine. I, I, I remember driving up with her to Manchester to an event with Dom and Francesca at an NHS Expo, in which we were all giving a little talk. And I think I spent most of the way there and back laughing at Jen's stories and really getting to know her. Sadly, she died in the coronavirus pandemic as part of her, in her working life. Uh, she's greatly missed, but she is a key part of what went into Hellblade 1, and I think that her spirit lives on in Hellblade 2 as well. And on that note, I'll say thank you for listening. So... I'm, I'm very happy to take questions from the floor, and there might be some online questions. So we've, we've got 15 minutes. We have a question online. Um, can you explain a bit more about the positive and negative psychosis symptoms? So, well, this is a very sort of textbook definition of of a syndrome that we call schizophrenia, where we think about some of the symptoms about being the unusual experiences that someone might have, like perceiving things that don't seem to be there or having beliefs that are really out of keeping with objective reality. And those are called positive because they're, they're there as things. And the negative symptoms can be really um, incapacitating to someone. So it might be a person feels very unmotivated. They might close themselves in their room, not feel like talking, uh, be, feel unable to express themselves. And those are called negative because there's a sort of lack of ability there. Um, there's some questions down here as well. Two questions. Do you think there's therapeutic potential? with things like Hellblade? Um, well, firstly, I should say that Hellblade was not devised to be... Uh, Hellblade was devised to be a game, to tell a story, to be a piece of art, to represent, and as such didn't have any therapeutic aspirations. My own feeling is that if somebody feels as though they're not being understood or they're having experience, they simply can't communicate to other people because those experiences are invisible and are silent... Um, I think there is a therapeutic potential in being able to show this representation and say, this is what it's like for me. And that resonates with what a lot of the 
um, messages that Ninja Theory were getting after the release of Hellblade. There's a broader question, which is, is there a therapeutic potential in games generally? And I think there really is. And in fact, it's been a, another pleasure of collaborating with Ninja Theory is their willingness to explore that area. Uh, and um, I was wondering, since that time that you guys started to work, um, which other games you think uh, have developed um, other, you know, interesting and you know, um, defined characters based on other type of mentally? Well, I, I've certainly noticed, I mean, that there are people in the room who could answer that question far more knowledgeably than I, but since I'm the one with the microphone, <laughs> you get what I say. So I've certainly noticed some games that have either explicitly or implicitly addressed uh, mental illness or um, altered perceptions of reality. In fact, one game released at the same time called What Remains of Edith Finch had a very interesting perspective on the progress of experiencing psychosis. It did it in a very different way. It didn't try to replicate the experiences, but it created an interesting story around somebody who had developed that and how they navigated through their life. So that, that's one example. There's also games looking at um, depression. So Sea of Solitude is one in which depression is represented in terms of the monsters that the person has to fight, monsters that make very critical comments about them. There's some beautiful evo evocations in games like Gris of things like the processes of grief. Um, and I, I, you know, again, I, as I, I'm not, in, I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of games in the way that many people in this room do, but I, I do think that we're seeing games seriously exploring the human condition and human distress in ways that stand up to any art form. So we've got two questions up. Incidentally, if I'm not, if your hand's up and I'm not seeing you, don't hesitate to shout at me because I'm a bit <laughs> short-sighted. Sorry, do go on. Thanks. Um, you've had a really interesting experience um, with co-creation um, in this sort of creative context. I wondered if you had had um, much experience with co-production within your research or whether this may have informed um, aspirations and interest in co-production in your research in future. I think if I'm honest with myself, this was my first real experience of working co-production in which it was genuine and, um, and, um, and organic. Um, prior to that, I'd had consultations, discussions that come under the heading of patient and public in, in involvement. But I think subsequent to that, knowing what it really generates, what it brings to the table, actually I and my team are much more interested in proper conversations that really shape the project. And in fact, I alluded to the idea of using video games as um, therapeutic inputs. So um, the team I'm working with, Lucy Daniel Watanabe leads them, and, and, and Ben Cook and others, are much more active than I ever was at their stage in terms of inviting input from lived experience. And there's another, just the gentleman behind there. You've um, told us how very traumatic experiences can shift the balance of perception so that you see things that aren't there. I'm wondering whether you have encountered uh, any instances where the tremendously immersive and powerful experiences that one can have in video games could perhaps also shift the balance of perceptions and even trigger some kind of psychosis? I've studied this literature, and I have not come across any instances in which there's been a clear um, instance of, of gameplay triggering psychosis. And I think one of the reasons for that is that the big difference between playing a game and experiencing a trauma is the agency that you have to make it stop. Um, clearly on a battlefield or if you're being neglected or traumatised by somebody else. The one thing you don't have is agency, and I think that's a very powerful reason why it's so toxic. In video game play, in horror film watching, in these other experiences, you, you can always stop it. So I, I don't have that worry. Clearly, um, the game and comes with and should come with uh, warnings about its content and Ninja Theory are very careful about that. 
Um, Sarah? Thank you for your presentation, Paul. It was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, I actually, lots and lots of questions have sprung into my mind, but I'm just going to ask one of them, which is um, around this new treatment that's sort of being pioneered at the moment, and I, I am dyslexic, so I cannot pronounce this word, <laughs> is psychos... The, the new, like, ketamine-type drugs? Oh, psychedelic. Psych yes. Yeah. And psycho... Whatever it is, psilocybin or something. Um, psilocybin, sorry. I'm big. That, that's the one I'm trying to say. Mm. Um, does that... At the moment, my understanding is that that's most suitable for people who are experiencing depression. But does it play a part um, in supporting recovery of people who are experiencing psychosis or not? Or would it actually be harmful in, in situations like that? I think the short answer is we don't know. We do know from some early experiments done with ketamine that um, if a person who has a diagnosis of schizophrenia and particular experiences like psychosis... Uh, have ketamine, then it will actually emphasise those experiences. So the initial thought is that it's, it's not a good idea at all. Um, however, if we take something like post-traumatic stress disorder, which I, is not a psychosis in itself, but it's associated with these very powerful, unreal experiences of reliving the trauma, then there is some suggestion that psychedelic treatments... Um, can have benefits for that. Um, why that might be, nobody really knows. There's a lot of suggestion, well, is it, it sort of allows you to reorganise your prior expectations in your brain and so forth, but that's really hand-wavy. Um, I, I think the short answer to your question is I would not be at all um, keen on the idea of it being given as a potential treatment for psychosis. Really I think it would be risky. That's really interesting. So I'm sure there are people out there who would yeah. happily do it. But, uh. Yeah, that's really interesting. OK, can I be cheeky and ask one really quick question, which is when I've had um, experiences of being um, very sped up and um, high mood, mm -hmm. the time, my perception of time is totally altered to when I'm depressed, when time just seems um, interminable. Uh, other, other than when you're actually up, it... it it just goes so quickly. Mm. So it's an altered sense of time, and I don't know if that's common across people who have um, psychosis or if that's something that's kind of unique to when your mind is racing. I've certainly come across people who've described in the context of psychosis that, that time concertinas. Mm. So certain things seem to take an absolute age and other things can just be gone in an absolute flash and that they can't predict how that's going to go. I mean, there are other associated things like stress that do make a big difference to our time perception as well. So there's probably all sorts of things going on in there. Mm, that's interesting. OK, I'm going to quickly... Yeah, thanks for your comments and questions. Uh. We do have another question online. OK. Um, since, psychosis and, uh, sorry, since psychosis is a phenomenon that impacts our visual field, could blind people still experience psychosis through auditory hallucinations? They can, yes. And in fact, in the process of going blind um, with macular de degeneration, as I suggested, actually that process can involve the creation of um, really bizarre and vivid visual hallucinations. But there's one fact that um, is very important and nobody really understands it, although a lot of people have made suggestions, which is that people who are born blind, who are congenitally blind, do not experience schizophrenia. That's a mystery. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. I found that very inspiring. And um, I just want to make a quick comment before I ask a question. That um, This seems to be like the perfect ethnography, which is where you represent people. And it seems that actually not only have you accurately represented people, but people identify with it and you've allowed people to experience the kind of phenomenological first-person um, experience. So that, that is, it just seems like the perfect ethnography for anthropologists. Um, and so my question is, in anthropology, we often focus on the sociality aspect. And that sounds very exciting that in this second um, part, there is going to be an emphasis on that. So I'm wondering, without obviously spoiling uh, the game, what, what kind of things can we learn about schizophrenia by focusing on the social dimension of how they interact with other people? 
Well, for me, one of the most... Well, firstly, thank you for your comment about ethnography. I'd never thought in those terms, but I suppose it means that I now have to get onto Wikipedia and find out more about ethnography. <laughs> um, but no, you, you, you know, joking aside, that comment is very valued and will get me reading. Um, with respect to this notion of being around others, I personally think it's a very fascinating and an important aspect of life with psychosis because firstly, it's, um, it highlights this dislocation that one might experience by having a, a reality that other people don't share. Um, but also, there's something in, um, that's been described in psychosis called double bookkeeping, which is the people's capacity to have their own reality, but at the same time to acknowledge and work with the reality that is generally agreed on in the society around them. And I think that creates an enormous amount of confusion and tension. And it's something that I believe that Hellblade 2 is actually um, is dealing with. And I, I can perhaps shelve that to the panel discussion because I think we could, we could uh, talk about that in interesting ways. But one, at a simple level, um, one thing that we've, we've discussed a lot is, you know, if you are hearing voices um, criticising you, that's one thing. But if you're talking to someone and the voices start criticising what that person is saying, uh, and causing you maybe not to trust them or um, to, to feel that they're being hostile to you, that becomes a very difficult man uh, situation to manage. And things like that, I think, are very important to try and get to grips with in the representation. Mm. We have another question. Thanks, Paul. That was fascinating. Oh, thank you. Um, so Senna is a female character, and I was wondering if you could say a bit about whether gender affects how psychosis is experienced or how it manifests, and whether that was something that was considered in the development of the game. Well, I can't speak for um, whether it was considered in the development of the game. I mean, I, I, Senna didn't happen by accident, and I, I'm therefore assuming that actually there was a deliberate choice that Senna would be a woman. Um, I think gender affects experiences in every aspect of life. So from the very beginning, as we build up our predictions about the world, about our expectations, our knowledge, our beliefs about how other people are going to treat us, what respect they will have for us, what they will expect from us, all of those come to, if you like, shape the lens through which we look at the world. And so it seems inevitable to me that you cannot separate the experience of gender from the experience that of psychosis, which is, after all, your repertoire of possibilities for interpreting the world, if you see what I mean. Uh, I don't think I have much useful to say really beyond that, but I think it's a really important point. And, and maybe we'll get a chance to think more about it in the panel discussion. I, I mean, it might be that you can talk to one of the Ninja Theory team about um, the original... Um, decision that, Je that uh, Senua would be a woman. We have time for one more question. <coughs> ah, I see a hand. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering, for people with psychosis, are there benefits of early intervention treatments on the intensity of the symptoms? The literature would suggest that that's, that's the case. I mean, it, re it really depends, I think, because as I've, I've tried to illustrate, I think there are many routes to that experience. Some of them um, are about your social situation, the stress you're under, the, the past history you've had, and that will motivate very different therapeutic interventions from somebody who perhaps has... Uh, some sort of imbalance related to an autoimmune condition that's producing psychosis. So I, I hesitate to give a one-size-fits-all answer, but the general rule, I think, is that um, meeting people early, finding out about their experiences early on, and trying to manage the situation from an early stage is almost always a good thing. Um, so I think that brings us to the end. Thank you very much indeed. I would just say that we're now going to have a break until uh, 20 to 4, 3.40 p.m. Thanks for joining us.
I've dreamt of this. This place of fear and fury. Do you hear it? The heartbeat of the lost ones. I can feel them on my skin.
Welcome back, everybody. Sorry, it's me again, but don't worry. You won't be hearing much from me if all goes according to plan. I'm really delighted that we are actually going to hear from people who are absolutely key in the making of the new game and, indeed, of the old game. Uh, and the idea is that we'll have this as a conversation amongst people. I'll be prompting people with some questions to get things going, but um, my hope is that people will spark off each other. The idea is that we'll have a conversation for an hour or so uh, and then take general questions from the floor and online. But that timing is, is approximate. So the first thing I want to do is to get my panel to introduce themselves and say a little bit about each of themselves to you. Emma. Thank you. So, hi, my name's Emma Taylor. I am the recovery lead for CPFT, which is Cambridgeshire Peterborough NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and I manage the recovery college and also the peer support workers. So I'm very, very proud of hiring people because of, not in spite of, mental health challenges. Hi, I'm Eddie. I'm a peer support worker. Um, I did the uh, Senawis Scholarship. Um, and I'm a Hellblade fan. Hi everyone, um, I'm Mark Slater Tunstall. I'm the visual effects director at Ninja Theory. Um, I've been with Ninja Theory for 11 years now and in game development for 24 years. Hi, my name's Lara Durham. I was the scriptwriter and stage director on Senua's Saga. Um, I've been at Ninja for about 10 years um, and about 20 years in the games uh, industry. Hi, good afternoon. Good to see people here. Um, so thank you, Paul and Ninja Theory, for inviting me. I'm Matthew Broom, a psychiatrist at the University of Birmingham, and I work clinically with young people with psychosis, but also some of my research around trying to understand the experiences of mental ill health. Great. Thanks, everyone. I, I really do feel it's a great privilege to have these people in the same room and ready to answer our questions. So I'd, I'd like to start with a very broad one, which is um, what, what is the value of representing experiences in this way and I'd like to pitch that first at Emma and Eddie um, I think because you know you, you put a lot of yourselves into this game what 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 is the value ultimately shall I go first yeah, so I think um, for me, one of the biggest things is it's increasing the accessibility to um, talk about mental health challenges. But I think it's already been alluded to. Um, I think Don mentioned it earlier as well about that immersive experience of actually being able to get a small insight into how it is like to live with those experiences. Um, and I think that's something that we, we talk about a lot in Recovery College about you can read about things, um, you know, you can talk to people, but to actually be able to, to experience some some of those experiences and understand how it feels um, can be a real way to sort of open that conversation and begin to understand where that person's coming from. Thank you. Eddie? Playing as Senua, you get to see her motivations for doing the things that she does. People don't do things for no reasons. People with... Uh, who are experiencing psychosis don't do things for no reasons. Those reasons might be hard to understand. Playing as Senna, where you get an insight into why. Um, another thing that I think is valuable about representing psychosis in games is that people who experience this often feel forgotten, left out. And uh, this game has Senna, uh as the main person and the hero, which is, I've never seen before in a video game, I don't think. I've seen them as the baddies lots of times, but yeah, this, this is the first, I think. It's changing that narrative almost, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, which is so important. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, both. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to you, Matthew, actually, with a similar sort of question, but... Um, I, th I think you're quite unusual in psychiatry in that you're very interested in the complexities of the experience itself without necessarily trying to reduce it to mechanisms. And I just wonder how you see this whole enterprise, which is about trying to represent the complexities. Yeah, I think uh, it's just been in a few different ways. I mean, the, the, the first area is a bit of the, the research I do is something called um, phenomenology, so thinking about experience. Mm. And one of the things um, 
phenomenology tries to tell us is to be open to new experiences. I think one of the things is it sometimes gets thought of as a very old-fashioned sort of dry and dusty textbook way of knowledge, but in fact, what's really important to do is, is gain those new areas of knowledge from, from people who have those experiences. So it should be democratic and open. Mm -hmm. I guess that's something that's really important. So I think any means you can do that through the co-production we've seen in Halberd is, is really important. And I do wonder, is this, is this of use? And hearing um, you know, our, our colleagues talk about how helpful they found Hellblade themselves, and that quote you showed at the end of your talk, Paul, was, re was really powerful. I see that people I work with as well, who say they found some of the experiences they've read about in some mm. of our, our texts, is really helpful to understand their own experiences, again, and the source of, of, of knowledge and agency for them going forward. So for me, it's, more, it's, it's less about a kind of um, classificatory, demarcating way of, of doing things, but it's a way of um, democratising, giving new knowledge. And I I think ways of portraying that in different media is even more powerful. The different artistic ways of doing that is, is incredibly powerful. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, Lara and Mark, as core artists on the procedure, do you see a special value in video games, maybe as opposed to other art forms? And, and um, perhaps this could prompt you to talk a little bit about how story and art are so deeply embroidered together. Mm. So that's a very general question, but just speak <laughs> around it. I think um, kind of before you get on about the story, I think one of the um, important things for me, you touched on in your talk, actually, traditionally in video game media, it's been represented really poorly and there's no need for that. Um, with, a, you know, with some research and actually being respectful to the subject matter, I think actually you can get across way more sort of serious and important themes to the player. Mm -hmm. And as you said, because the player has agency, they're going through the the experience, not just as an observer. Mm -hmm. It can sink in a lot more. And you, you make people think a bit more about what's happening to that character and you sort of question things. Um, so I think it's, it's a really important medium um, that can do a, a lot of good. Um, Thank yeah. you. I think I think that's right, and I think it goes back to what what you said before, Paul. It, it's a an active process of discovering the world mm -hmm. in a video game for a player. It's not a story that you're being told; it's a story that you're discovering along mm -hmm. with this the character, along with Senua. And um, just on the point about weaving everything together. We can do a lot of storytelling with the world around us as well as with what people say, and that's yeah. something that the player has the opportunity to to actively discover themselves. Right. Thank you. That's really helpful. So it, it's one thing, of course, to aspire to these things, and success is another matter. And I think I would treat you, Eddie, and you, Emma, as, as key arbiters of whether it's been successful and what its successes are. So could you speak to that and what, what you think it has achieved? Uh, collaborating with um, Ninja Theory on this game, um, I can vouch for the experiences that Senua has looking, sounding and feeling authentic. Uh, we had a question earlier about uh, our games likely to trigger uh, experiences. I, I don't know, I don't think so, but they certainly uh, take me to those places, those experiences that I've had um, in a way that's very, very real. Um, I think that's a success. Uh, I don't want people to have to go through this, but I would like them to know what it's like so they have some kind of understanding. Thank you. And I think, to sort of to continue that a wee bit, I think the representation, we, we have to be careful that, and I think it's, again, Dom, um, or somebody said earlier that everybody's experiences are unique. Um, and I think that's something that we have to be mindful of, that Senua's experiences are Senua's experiences. And that's just a snapshot of how somebody can experience things that possibly other people don't. But I think the power that it has done, has been shown in the um, quotes that you gave, and I was speaking with Paul earlier and saying, you know, I know when Ninja Theory put out a tweet um, about um, the games that are coming up, it's people saying, 
saying, oh my goodness, I know the, how that feels. You know, I can now talk about this. I can connect to that person. So I think it's, it's done a huge amount of value in actually beginning to open that conversation and demystify. I think mm. what can be seen often as quite a, a scary and um, violent, actually, um, illness um, that actually it, it isn't. Um, so I think it's done massive um, benefits in that. Thank you so much. So, I mean, in many ways, that's speaking to Hellblade 1, um, perhaps more, because Hellblade 2 has yet to be released. Lara and Mark, can I ask you where you're taking this story in trying to achieve that sort of success? Well, we want, we want to take, take our starting point to be the end of the first game, so we're not it's a it's a journey for Senua. She's not um, going backwards. She's not staying static. She's mm. she's on a journey, and and the next game represents the next stage of that journey. So she will, I think, as we've alluded to, has achieved a certain kind of peace and a certain kind of acceptance of herself and her experiences and her past, which whilst she's not able to fully put it behind her, mm -hmm. it still affects her. She has enough of a kind of sense of agency now and a sense of purpose that she can look forward to the future and look outwards to the world as opposed to staying kind of inside herself. Mm. So we find her going out into the world, taking on a, a mission that involves other people, helping other people, being responsible for other people, and uh, planning for the future, that kind of thing, and mm. kinds of things that she, the center of the first game, probably wouldn't have been able to do so much. Okay. Yeah, and I think that. That oh, links no, to recovery so much, like just hearing that you can't leave those experiences in the past, but you can move forward. And I think as you said about sort of thinking inwards and then being outward with uh, where you are and supporting other people and using those experiences just encompasses recovery. Sorry, that was a bit random. but don't know. That's, <laughs> that's really relevant. Thank you. Um, actually, it does, it does speak to a question that we received in advance online, which I'll just raise here. You may have something else to say to this. Um, What's the biggest difference after the conclusion of the first game? Will Senua use her psychosis to her advantage? Philip D. Branco asks. I don't think there's a sense of, of using it to her advantage, but her uniqueness, her, her worldview has, um, has value and has, has utility and is important. Um, and mm. it's... It will come um, in handy for herself and for other people. I wouldn't say that it's it's being used as a as a superpower or anything like that, but it is part of her, and it's um, yes, yeah, it's, it's valuable. Right. Yeah, I think one of the unique things about the game is it's always told through her eyes, so it's it's her experience. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, obviously in in the sequel, she's mixing with other people's experiences and mm. some of those may clash, some of those may yeah. align with her experiences. So it's a really interesting place for us to take. Yeah, and I'd, I'd, I'd certainly like to take up on that. I mean, b before I do, I we're talking about experiences and you know, turning to you, Matthew, uh, you've really made a, a serious study of the nature of experiences um, and surveying the breadth of experiences in psychosis and other things. Um, do you think like an enterprise like this can ultimately succeed, given that richness and breadth? It's a real challenge for us as researchers, because one of the issues I have is that um, capturing this experience is a very uh, high-density informational task, mm. and with that comes the fact it becomes less representative, because it's a, f a select few case studies perhaps you get written up in detail mm. and become an archetype of the experience, and as, as Eddie Nemez just said, we can't, there's, there's a lot of heterogeneity within, within that, and so you have to bear that in mind. Um, but I think there are some sort of core features, and that's, I guess, the tradition I've worked in, people always talk about the change of time, the change of interpersonality, mm. how your body may shift, mm. and certainly there are some certain some themes from some of my own empirical work that chime a lot with some things in Hellblade about how voices interact with the person, how there's an emotional element to it, mm. 
how sometimes there can be a sort of tactile component alongside an auditory one. So there are some things that, that occur. And I think I'm really looking forward to, to, to um, the, the sequel because I think the interpersonal element and how the person interacts with, with their family, with their friends going forward mm. is, is, is really um, going to be very interesting to see. And one of the saddest things I see as a clinician, and again, thinking back to your talk, Paul, is the kind of self-isolation that can sometimes occur in, in, in psychosis because these awful mm. myths about violence and loss of control. Mm. I've had lots of young people say to me, you know, doctor, I'm going to stop going to the pub and see my friends because I'm worried what will happen to me. Mm. And that just seems very sad because we know that, you know, trusting relationships are so important for recovery. Yeah. And, um, you know, isolation can make these distressing experiences more frequent and more intense. So in some ways it becomes a slightly vicious circle for people sometimes. Yeah, well, I mean, let's take that theme up because I, th I do think that, um, you know, the way the new game is going, one very big difference is that we see Senua in a social setting. And I'd like to spend some time discussing that. And in fact, um, well, Lara, I'd, li I'd like to start with you. So how, how vital is it to the story, this social setting? And, and what opportunities and challenges does it give to you as a writer in terms of representing and thinking about Senua? And be before you answer, I, I should say there have been some questions online that have... I'm not expecting you to answer them, but I, I just want to acknowledge them because they're same for different formulations of this question. So, uh, Cesar Can 097. Well, I, I'll, I'll stop saying who sent them. What has been the challenge of translating experience of psychosis into the narrative form? Um, and does Senua face these demons in the new game, or has she been able to quell some of the voices in the game? Well, that's a good starting point. Mm. Um, I'll take it from there. Great. Uh, as I alluded to before, I don't think there's any sense that she's put everything behind her in the past. She, was, she still has the furies. She still has the shadow. They're, they're, they're with her always. Mm. Mm. What, what is changing is her relationship to them and her ability to kind of choose to not listen or to listen. Mm-hmm. So she's not as uh, besieged as she was in the first game. Um, mm. So there's definitely a sense of progression, but the change is really kind of in her and not in the, the nature of her experiences. Mm. And I think that the idea of, of her meeting other people is, is really vital. Like the, the mission that she's on is to given what happened to her, her lover Dillian in the first game, she's um, promised him uh, that that will not happen to anybody else. That nobody else will suffer at the hands of the Vikings. Yeah. So that's the beginning. And it's, it's a very, you know, it's a very unselfish quest that she's on. She's, she's setting out to protect and to save other people. So given that this is her quest we bringing other people into this situation was was kind of necessary, mm -hmm. and we were really interested in exploring how not just how difficult it might be for Senua to to have to come up against other people and their expectations and their preconceptions, but also what those expectations and preconceptions how they might fit Senua into those, um, mm -hmm. how they might different people might see her differently. Yeah. So it's been it's been really fascinating. Um, I guess the most obvious question for us was on a very fundamental level: what is it like the experience of of maybe hearing voices and then having to try and have a conversation with someone else while that's going on? Mm. What you know, what happens to your attention? What would the voices kind? Of, what kind of things would they say about the person who is speaking? How would they react to mm. what? is happening um i think we have a clip called uh outside the settlements which maybe if we could play that that's just a little example of Great. the conversation that's going on it's here.
depths of the dead. There's something here. You hear them? They are not I need to find out what it is. They are. They are. They're dead. You're mad. She's not mad. He doesn't <laughs> see the signs. Tommy sends He doesn't You're see mad. The signs. He doesn't know. He doesn't see the signs. There is no way. You've described this sense of communicating with another person, which is very new in this game, yeah. while at the same time balancing the experiences, the inner experiences. I mean, before coming to you, Eddie and Emma and Matthew, I'd, I'd like to ask you, Mark, what are the challenges that this brings artistically with a relatively small team in terms of having mm. new characters with their own voices and their own... So the, yeah, there's a huge amount of challenge with that. Um, taking that as an example from an audio perspective, we we obviously want to represent the voices that Senua has, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we also want the player to be able to kind of understand what's going on in the scene. And it's it's been quite a bit of iteration to find that balance of the power of the the voices with information that we need to give the player in, in certain scenes. Mm. But I think um, it, it really does sort of work quite well in kind of conveying the struggle that, that people can have, like trying to concentrate on certain things when they've got something in their head that is so important mm -hmm. that they just need to kind of find out what is the source of that. Um, so yeah, from an audio perspective, that's that's really tricky. And when um, the actresses that we use uh, for the Furies, a lot of that is not pre-scripted. We don't kind of write every single word they're going to say. We kind of set up the scene, what are the emotions, the feelings, and then they're reacting live to the scene itself. So it feels a lot more natural, and, and that happens throughout the entire game. So it's a very improvised performance, I think, for for those voices. Mm. Um, it's not random at all. We're not just kind of picking random phrases and throwing them in. It's all very bespoke for every single scene in the game. Um, so yeah, that's obviously a challenge. And then obviously the the other more technical challenges, like, you know, making all these characters. Um, we worked with fantastic costume designers, um, that kind of thing to really realize everything. One of the key things right from the start was we think it has to be realistic and believable to let the players really suspend their disbelief and be completely immersed. So that's why we've spent so much time working on the realism of the game, like making real costumes, going to Iceland, scanning all the locations. Because I think if, you've, if the player doesn't start questioning the space they're in, they get invested a lot more in, in the story and the themes that are happening. So although we've got a very realistic environment, it's still through the lens of Senua. So it's mm. her version of that realism. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, a nice technical mix of, mm. of getting it realistic, but Senua's realism. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and really powerful, I think, that the Furies are not scripted, that it is a, mm. they are responding to the situation yeah. as they see it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's important to have it a bit more ad-libbed like that and a bit mm. more reactive. Um, yeah. Because from talking to to you, Eddie, and, and everyone else, it's like, you know, you, you're not expecting it sometimes. Yes. Um, understanding what's going on as a player of my own life, um, when you're experiencing unusual things, voices... Um, that are interacting with other people. It, it, it makes talking with people really complicated. Um, yeah. It meeting people and speaking with them is a big part of my experiences. Um, thinking there's more going on with the different people you meet, that they represent things, mm. that they might represent historical, biblical, mythical mm. characters. Mm. Um, earlier on you said about the visual, audi audio, and uh, narrative things. 
that happen, and the narrative is a big part of it. You might meet somebody, and uh, they could rep represent something that's happening. Mm. Uh, and that's a big part of what Senua experiences. She's, uh, she's got a very important mission to do. Like Laura said, it's uh, altruistic motivation that she has. Uh, she wants to help people. And that can become a very important part of uh, your journey and your experiences. Uh, say you're in a ward and you meet somebody who uh, has some trauma happening, you really want to help them resolve that. And that becomes all important to you. And I, I really feel like this game shows that it shows Senua's reasons for her doing things. Mm. Um, rather than uh, psychosis being a way of getting out, having to show somebody's motivation. Yeah. The psychosis is the motivation. That's why she's doing it. Yeah. Nobody's ever done anything because of, uh, just because of psychosis. It's for their own reasons, which might be hard to understand. Having the internal perspective you get in Hellblade, rather than a looking from the outside, you, you, you really understand why she's doing the things that she does. And that, that's very important to us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think I'm really glad to hear you say that, I think, because there can be a tendency for people to think it's sort of random behavior. Mm. And it's certainly not. No. I mean, I want to stay on the theme of Senua being among other people and ask you, Matthew, um, you know, in my field, certainly, I think that there's a flaw sometimes that people focus on individual processes, individual brains, isolated cases. And, and to what extent do you think that your work is engaging with the broader picture, with interactions with others? And how difficult is that? I think it's a challenge. I mean, um, the, the, the sort of the historical um, work on experience of, of, of mental ill health sort of takes this quite seriously. So I guess from the work of you know, French philosophers like Sartre, but also how it got picked up by um, psychiatrist philosophers like Franz Fanon, who mm -hmm. talked about the relationship of being seen to be black and how it links with the issues around rationality, irrationality, mm -hmm. how you were othered and objectified by those who saw you. Mm -hmm. And similarly, how um, Lang, uh, a, 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 a Scottish psychiatrist, psychotherapist, took some of these ideas and again, um, sort of talked about the other in gaze and how to objectify people. So some of these themes are really important, actually, in, in terms of context of the sort of social ecology in, in which you sit. Mm. And certainly with my, with my, my patients, I often have a little talk, a sort of pre-Christmas talk about, you know, they're all very excited about going home for the family. And we say, well, this, is, this can be a good time, it can be a tough time. There's emotional stresses, there's emotional fatigue, there's, there's seeing people, there's disappointment. So I think these are really important, crucial things to discuss. And, um, you know, practically, just, just, just hearing the discussion about um, the experiences and somebody who may be having voice hearing in parallel with normal conversation, that's a very real thing. As clinicians, we quite often will talk to somebody who will be distracted or responding to something else. And, you know, when we're medical students, we got taught, um, you know, hallucination is a perception without an object. But I think that's, that's not the case. I mean, I was going to say that they're sort of hyper-real because you or I can walk away from somebody who's talking to us or we can block our ears or we can <laughs> make a noise and block it out. That, that can't happen. It's this kind of persistent per pervasiveness that can be, I think, quite mm. distressing. So it's, it's more than, I guess, a normal um, experience. And um, as Eddie's kind of said, it makes it really hard then to have a conversation in that parallel world and that other reality mm. alongside it that's trying to dominate your existence. So I think that's where people can appear to be disconnected or, or vague, but in fact, they're just trying to do cognitively multitasking massively. Mm. And that's, that's, I think, what we, we sometimes see externally. But internally, it feels like a huge amount is going on. Mm. Yeah, thank you. So, Emma, can I ask you to take up this idea of... I mean, I think people, including people who should know better, can focus solely on the individual, treat them as the, where the problem resides. Um, to what extent is it the social circle and, uh, you know, the, the interactions that are, are key to understanding, both negative and positive? So I might go off on a tangent here. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really interesting just hearing the panel and, and especially Matthew talking about the isolation um, and, and people go within themselves. And I think 
it's scary. It's it's vulnerable for the person to know who they can trust, who they can talk to, um, how are they going to be sort of um, responded to? Um, am I going on the right tangent? Yeah, no, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think it's... For me, though, that is what recovery is. It's being with other people. Um, it's being alongside people. It's being with people. Um, but I think that takes great strength. Um, and as I said, that vulnerability, and we've spoken about empathy earlier, it's it's not necessarily saying, I understand what you're going through, because, again, our experience is unique. Um, but there is something about being willing to listen and being willing to learn. And I think we've really reiterated it again today that those experiences are real. Um, so it's... It's not. Um, it, it's real to them. It's it's happening to them. Um, so I think the sense of community is is incredibly important when we're talking about recovery as as right. a whole. Brilliant. And so you, not only are you perfectly on track, but you've also segued into a question that I wanted to ask next, which was, thank thanks so much. Um, so it's the question. There was always this idea: Senua wouldn't undergo a miracle cure. That um, you know that's not necessarily recovery and I'd like to put it to you Lara what you know where does the second game take her in those terms I know you've, you've touched on this already but it'd be good to hear more yeah I did I, I think the biggest change is is her agency um, mm. she she's not subjected to things anymore or at least not in a way that is passive or unbearable she's able to push back to a certain extent against the voices and the 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 stimuli that she is experiencing mm. she's able to make a decision and make a plan look forward to the future mm -hmm. look at other people's perceptions of the world and take them on board mm -hmm. even if she ultimately you know still chooses her own way she's able to kind of assess uh, and analyse the world a lot more than she was able to in the first game. But so agency, I think, is the key, the key. She, she's looking again, as I said before, looking outward, looking to the future, mm. um, and she has the ability to to make decisions. Right. Thank Would you. you say like the relationship has changed then? Like those those experiences are no longer in control of, of Senua. She's almost in control of them, which I think sounds like a bit of a shift. I think I think that's that's almost right, and that is a it's a it's a shift. I I, do, I wouldn't say she's in control of them because I, she doesn't control you know what happens and when they happen, but she can she can respond to them in a way that she couldn't before. She can tell her father to to be quiet she can she can listen to what the voices both inside voices and outside voices are saying and say no i i can choose i'll choose what to do just okay. jump in and i guess it just was really interesting hearing that discussion because i think in my, in my time as a psychiatrist paul i'm not sure you'd agree i've seen a sort of shift in how we think about outcome in in psychosis from reducing symptoms to thinking about function, recovery, and then perhaps now in the phase now of sort of co-produced, patiently meaningful, meaningful outcomes that are relevant mm. to patients. I think maybe that's what we're seeing here, that um, one can have psychosis and have a meaningful life with purpose going forward, rather than, you know, perhaps thinking about certain scores and symptom scales, and that was mm. our goal. So I think there's been that shift, even in the time I've been practising, which is very welcome, I think. Yeah. I think we need more of that with our trials and everything else we do. Yeah. Thanks, and I think that accords with what you've just said, Emma, very well. Um, Eddie, do you have any thoughts on recovery and its nature? Um, Can I jump in whilst you think? Yes, please. <laughs> so I think <clears throat> recovery is such a, a unique and individual experience. Um, and I think I just want to really reiterate uh, what Matthew was saying around... I think we are moving very much away from reduction or getting rid of these experiences. And I also want to say that some experiences are actually really, really good um, and can be really, really helpful and make us the unique people that we are. Um, so actually, we don't want to get rid of everything. And I think there's something incredibly powerful um, about being able to live well with um, and live alongside. And I think that's something that's been really paramount in my recovery. So whilst I don't experience psychosis, um, I have a, a, a lifelong um, condition 
condition. And that sort of understanding that, okay, that's, that's going to be there, but this is what I can do. This is what I can bring. Um, and for me, that's, that's kind of what recovery is about. We spoke about um, trust, knowing who you can trust. And we had a question earlier about using, about Senua using uh, this to her advantage, psychosis to her advantage in the work that we do as peer support people, as uh, the teachers at Recovery College do. It is very important for what we do. And we use it to our advantage all the time. Um, with my people that I see go and support. Um, sometimes sharing lived experience can help them to trust you. Um, it might be that the medical people, they feel worried that they're trying to hurt them, or uh, I certainly did. Uh, having those experiences in common. Like you said, psychosis is always different mm. uh, for, for everybody. It's always different. Um, when you've got bits of experience that, that rhyme with each other, that can really build trust. It's that connection, isn't it? That connection. Yeah, um, yeah with the recovery, um, Another way that uh, this can help is if uh, I think that being well at the moment now can help my people to believe that they might be able to get better for a time in the future. Um, so yeah, the one thing that was quite difficult for me working uh, with you, collaborating with Ninja Theory is because when I'm not, when, I'm, when I don't have symptoms, sometimes I wonder who am I to represent people who are experiencing terrifying things now. Um, but like you said, it's, it's uh, yeah, we're thinking about the recovery rather than the symptoms, especially with this game. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. So, I mean, it's a hugely complex, nuanced trajectory that Seno goes through, and I'd just like to put you on the spot a bit, Mark, or, and Laura, and ask, you know, how does one even think about going to represent this in the visual and the auditory experiences? So I think um, I'll probably break this down into a couple of sections. Yep. So first off, being able to collaborate with you all. So having you come in, um, Eddie, you've been particularly articulate at describing some of those experiences, which has been like amazing for us. And mm. the key has just been listening, mm -hmm. like listen to that. And then basically some of the themes and ideas, you then go back to Senua's character and go, right, how would this manifest itself? in her particular situation um, with all the, you know, she's got all her preconceptions, but she's been put onto this brand new um, place in the world that she's never been to. Mm -hmm. How do those stimulus cause things that um, sort of you've talked about to manifest themselves? So it's, it's a case of, um, yeah, just trying to work through that. Have you guys come back and kind of look at what we're doing. So you've been back multiple times to the studio. and That's been fantastic. We've got to show you parts of the game and you've given us amazing feedback of, are we not going far enough on some things? Is that not quite right? Um, so, mm -hmm. so it's a very iterative thing, I think. And um, speaking of the iteration as well, within the team at Ninja Theory, um, a game like Hellblade is so difficult to pre-plan like it's you can't just sort of design it on paper and then go make that it just doesn't work like that it's not until all the elements come together and kind of work together in unison that the game actually then starts to feel like it should so if if you're looking at a section that is missing audio for example you can't really review it particularly well because it's like 
I, I don't actually know if that scene is, is making particular sense because I'm missing Senua's voices or whatever. And same with the visuals as well. Mm. So it's, we have to iterate a lot. And it's um, one of the advantages of being a slightly smaller team than bigger AAA productions is we can try stuff out, get it in, get some feedback on it and not be afraid to go, that's not right. It doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't feel right. Um, the whole game is so much about how it makes you feel, how, how the player feels, rather than mechanics and, yeah. and things like that. Yeah, I mean, could you give some... Because I, I am very struck by this idea that yeah, the whole has to be more than the sum of its parts. Mm. It's not that you get a good audio and a good visual and a good right. story and a nice environment. There's yeah. something about the way they come together. Can you give an example of... Um, yeah, I, I think... Um, like just some of the improvements we've even made over the first game with the audio and the visuals being synced up a lot more. Mm. So a, a visual stimulus like is directly linked to the audio. Mm. So that just sets you in the scene even more. Um, we've obviously continued with all the spatial audio, binaural audio. So the world that um, Senna was inhabiting, the players experiencing, just feels a lot richer than it did before so, and i think it's key that it's those things aren't separated mm. like the environment the characters the audio the the effects mm. all have to work together um for it to work yeah do you have yeah. any and examples sir? oh i was going to say and i think also that it's not random none of it's random it mm. comes from um, it comes from Senua. Everything comes from Senua. It's mm -hmm. filtered through her experiences, her past. So everything that happens in the world happens because of her, um, happens through her eyes. And it's not just, you know, random, you know, mm -hmm. crazy things happening. It's all purposeful and mm -hmm. meaningful. Yeah. And so I guess kind of bouncing off that as well, like... Um, Taking the realistic environment of Iceland, for example, a lot of the more hallucination sort of um, style things that happen, we've taken the realistic environmental elements mm -hmm. and then kind of manipulated them because that's how Senua would be perceiving them. So it's it's real for her, but might not be realistic for um, for the rest of us, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. But because it's grounded in the realistic nature of everything that we're seeing, it makes sense for Senua. Yeah. Did you have a, a clip? Um, oh, actually, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, if we have a look at, um, was it, it Settlement Inside? I can't remember what the name of the video is called. Settlement Rune? Settlement Rune, yes, if we have that video. So this illustrates the point. Yes. A little bit of context for that scene. Um, she's come across a, a village that's been sort of devastated. She doesn't know what from. And the stimulus of her seeing kind of people that have been kind of killed or sacrificed manifests itself in basically expanding out into kind of larger patterns um, within the world. Um, and that's something that sort of has a, a theme throughout the game, but it's... It's those external stimuluses that then feed into what she is manifesting um, for her reality. Okay, thanks. Mm. Um, so we've actually begun to talk here, an extremely good panel, because you introduce in your answer to the question what I'm, what I'm going to ask in the next question. So thank you. Collaboration. I mean, it's a sort of elusive creature. Um, to, to get a collaboration that works. There was a question asked earlier about co-production and collaboration. And uh, I always used to think I did it, and then I experienced it with Ninja Theory and with you, and I realised what it is. And I'd just like to get your thoughts along the line on what, what makes collaboration work. Uh, can I start with you, Matthew? Because, of course, you work in a field that necessarily involves a collaborative approach. 
Yeah, I think we need to do a lot more. So one of the things, um, you know, I sometimes worry about, and Eddie kind of had a, 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 a small element of it, is that what is it for me to speak about somebody else's experience? There's an ethics of, of this. Mm. And I always feel very conscious of that as somebody without psychosis talking about, about that. So one of the things we're trying to do with our current Welcome Award is to try and actually bring kind of co-production and some of this kind of more technical, philosophical approach in, in tandem. Because like lots of people with lived experience will contact me and say the time is really helpful. They're nervous of the, the jargon or the scholarly practices we all have. So one of the things we're trying to do is sort of develop sort of um, co-production and mentorship partnerships to help people work together on projects and produce some academic output. So we're trying to sort of diversify um, the academic field. Um, and also, I think, um, try and bring in um, scholars with lived experience already into that field who, who want to speak about that more, more fully and work with um, MAD Studies as well, who seem to be very strong allies in this area. Mm. So um, particular work with colleagues in, in, in Oxford and in Sweden, Paul Lodge and Sophia Jepson, who are really passionate about, about this work. Um, in Birmingham, we try to have a very, um, uh, very strong youth advisory group, a very diverse group of young people from the city with a range of different lived experiences. And we try to really embed those in most of what we do. So not only things like research, but also you know, the teaching content we deliver, our, our recruitment practice and our governance. So again, as much as you can, trying to change the power dynamic. I mean, it's hard to do with the structure of universities and the NHS. But what we can do, we, 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 we try and do. Mm. And I think there is a, you know, there's a, there is that genuine back to what I said in, in your first question, Paul, is that, it's that there's new knowledge there we can benefit from. The whole field of, of, of mental health research and practice can benefit from. Mm. So I think um, it'd be, be daft for us not to. It's, it's sometimes us battling through the structures to make it happen. Yeah, and if I can just move along to you, Lara. I mean, what do you think makes the collaborations work? Um, I think we just need to, to be prepared to let go of things that we maybe like but that don't fit and to listen to people. Yeah. Um, that might seem a bit fatuous but that that's I think the heart of it like you can't hold on to things that you think are right in the face of other evidence so <laughs> you have to let it go yeah Thanks. and I mean Mark you've alluded to the process a bit um this iterative process could you say a bit a bit more about that or yeah I think you and know what you think makes it work uh, yeah it's like you have to kind of trust the team you're working with I think and you have to be able to be open and discuss the ideas try things out mm -hmm. be prepared to fail quickly try again mm. um, so and I know you know this is is quite a difficult thing for much bigger kind of sort of teams within the industry to do um, just because of the way things have sort of always been structured um so for a, a slightly smaller team like ninja theory this this actually works really well um so yeah it's 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 that iteration of the the collaboration um and i think you find that you you have this nice organic thing within games where you'll randomly see something on someone's screen and it will just trigger a thought or an idea mm -hmm. and then a com conversation starts around it and sometimes that can peel off in directions you weren't planning to do mm. but can be really interesting i think um that happens a lot like definitely with the first game and definitely with with this game where you know we've Two years ago, we probably had an idea of what the game is, but actually what we've got right now is a little different to that idea mm -hmm. because of these these sort of collaborations and, and sort of different snowballing ideas. Yeah. Thanks. So, Eddie, what's your experience of the collaborative approach? The reason why the collaboration, um, the, the way that we've been doing it works is because of the way that you've been doing it. Um, the amount of respect and dignity that we're given by Ninja Theory is incredible. Um, uh, and it's, it's another opportunity for me to use my lived experience as a, as a good thing. Um, five years ago when I got my, uh, I got accepted for the, uh, for the first Senawis scholarship, I was uh, talking to Dom and Augie about, uh, about my lived experience up until that point, and I couldn't do it. I felt like I couldn't physically do it. It was uh, often what will, from what, what I've seen, um, and 
what I've experienced myself is that you're not allowed to talk about these things. You're not allowed to say what voices say to you. You know the curse that Sophie has in Howl's Moving Castle, and the clause of it is she can't talk about it. It's a bit like that, and I, I, I couldn't do it. Uh, a year, two years ago, maybe when I was talking to you and Laura, I'd said to myself that I'm going to try and make it so nothing is off off the... Uh, it's not allowed to be spoken about. E everything, for this project, for Saga, everything is okay. Everything goes. And um, it was really difficult then mm. because of just how comfortable and respected I feel at Ninja Theory. I, now, I, now we... Uh, we talk quite, quite you know, openly about things that have happened, and um, so yeah, is 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 trust is is why the collaboration is working. Uh, this is semi-related, but I want to say it. I wanted to play um, sacrifice. I wanted to play Hellblade One, so it was sacrifice. And I knew talking about the whole effect of it, not just the individual parts, but the whole effect is so powerful, just from seeing clips, that if I'm playing it on my own with headphones on, um, uh, on a console, I knew that it was gonna be a very uh, difficult experience. It was gonna, it was going to, it, it could take me back there. Um, Ninja Theory have made it so I can play the game in a place where I'm very comfortable now um, with people, um, a friendly environment. I don't put the headphones on. So there's someone else who can experience it with me. And uh, it's, been, it's been lovely. It's, a, it's a, uh, obviously a very scary game and it, it brings back a lot of things that have happened, but um, it is, it's, it's been an absolutely wonderful experience, feeling like I can share these things. And it, something beautiful and meaningful and special coming out of all of the things that we've all done together. So, so I, I, I want to thank Ninja Theory for being the way they have been with me on this, uh, on this project. It's been, it's been yeah, t turning something that's been traumatic and terrifying into something helpful as yeah it's trust mm. why it works thanks Eddie Emma I don't know how to follow that, that one but yeah. <laughs> I think for me we've we've touched on a lot actually around tokenism and I remember um, when I um, got my role three years ago um, my boss explaining this and going to Ninja Theory and almost grilling Ninja Theory going why are you doing this what's your purpose um, like almost interviewing them and and actually it's that belief that what I bring is just as important as what doctors bring. It's just as important as, as anybody else. And, you know, Eddie and I were talking earlier and, and we had a little bit of like imposter syndrome and we're like, what, what are we bringing? Like, why are we on this panel? And actually, we're experts in our own right. Um, and I think that is what um, people that are going into co-production and collaboration need to remember is that we all have our own experiences. We all have our own skills and unique things. And it's not to say, as I said, that one's more important, but actually, I think it's, it, we talk about the whole sum coming together, mm -hmm. and I think that's what the power is, is of getting all of those different experiences, valuing them all, and I think, Laura, what you said was so, so interesting, because um, I can be sometimes like, I've got this idea, and it's amazing, and then I'll go into a room, and my team will be like, no, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so there is something that you kind of have to put your pride to one side, um, and truly value what everybody's bringing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, everyone. So, um, we've come to sort of almost an hour and I'd like to throw it open to the audience here and also to the online audience. But before I do, I'd just like to ask one more question. Um, and that is, what are your hopes for the new game? What, what would you like, just very briefly from each, what would you like to see it achieve? I think just, is that to me? Go ahead. <laughs> I we'll think go in the opposite direction. <laughs> greater, greater awareness from an authentic um, sort of perspective, which is exactly what that lived experience is bringing, um, and to continue those discussions to realise, uh, to help people realise they're not alone. I think would be the biggest thing for me. Great. Yeah. Um, 
I would like someone who plays the game to uh, who who's had similar experiences happening or have happened to them to uh, uh, be able to um, that was I think if uh, someone playing this recognizes the experiences in the game, the Hellblade website that tells you where you might be able to find support in your area, that would be a very good outcome. Um, and uh, I would like people who have lived experience to feel like uh, so when I came here today, I thought that I might not be let in. Um, because that's happened to me before. When I've been experiencing symptoms, I've been denied entry into places. I've been kicked out of places. Uh, I thought that the, the security people here might be able to feel and see the, uh, um, the lived experience expertise uh, coming from me, and yeah, they might they might block my way, but that didn't happen. They knew I was coming, and uh, uh, here is sort of an expert. I never felt like an expert because of this stuff before, but um, I, I would like people to uh, uh, feel like there's value in their experiences. Um, mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I guess for me, like, I just really hope players let themselves be immersed by it and kind of really take something from the story that kind of evolves throughout the game. Um, I think there's, you know, it's, it's quite a, an intense game to get through. Yeah. Um, and it's a bit different to everything else that is out there. And I really hope that, like, people sort of kind of respect and, and like what we've put together. Um, Thank you. Because, yeah, it's been been a really awesome kind of collaboration, as we've said, um, and we've been taking some risks that I think kind of doesn't happen that often within the industry. Mm. Um, so, yeah, hope people, hope people like it. <laughs> Lara? I would like everybody who saw something of themselves in Senua in the first game to to um, enjoy and and find this next part of her journey convincing and anyone coming to it new who sees something of themselves in Senua for them to feel like we're uh, respectfully and honestly representing something like their experiences and one last thing, sorry, <laughs> that, um, that I hope that it encourages maybe a little bit of thought and analysis about the ways in which um, everybody constructs their own reality. Everybody, not just Senua and people like Senua, but we all do it. Thank you. Matthew, can I have your... Well, I'm very looking, much looking forward to seeing it in, in, a, in a month or so, so that's really exciting. Um, I suppose as you were... I was sort of thinking of Lara's and Eddie's answer to previous questions. So I guess the, the one thing I'd really like is, I guess, through that, understanding what Senna was going through, self-understanding to come to people and in turn some agency. So this idea of learning from another person's experience, one can understand one's own experiences, and that leads to um, control and agency in the world. And I think, second, that's sort of Eddie's point, really, if we can try and make those institutional spaces more welcoming, so people who, who play the game might see themselves, whether they have psychosis or not, as part of the wider endeavour to improve mental health care and to be places like a Cambridge college or a laboratory or a, a big funding organisation, a place they should be part of and, and, and joining with us in, in that. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. So I'm going to throw it open for questions now. Um, so we have microphones. And Jess is the first hand I see. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you to all of you. That was very interesting. Um, Eddie and Mark, I think, especially have touched on this. And Mark was just saying about letting yourself be immersed in the experience and that being a big focus. And I'm interested in that from the perspective of kind of people who, don't, who aren't at risk of psychosis don't experience psychosis. When we watch 
movies or play video games or go to the, the theatre, we suspend disbelief. So I guess the question has two parts, really, which is firstly, to what extent is the experience of that immersion different if you haven't experienced a psychotic episode compared to if you have? And also whether that might contribute to... I think, Eddie, you were talking about the apprehension you felt about going back into that environment and whether that might be related to the ability to then come back out of that suspension of disbelief. Yeah. So take, first, you go for it. You look at it. I obviously can't answer half of that question. Um, I'm hoping that the immersion in the game for people who are experiencing or have experienced psychosis, I hope that it instills a sense of hope in them that recovery can happen because Senua is progressing along her road to recovery. Um, I, I hope that the, the immersion of the game would, uh, would aid in that. Um, hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I guess from from the perspective of, of someone that hasn't had those experiences, um, I think hopefully playing the game, kind of letting yourself get drawn into it, it just gives you a little bit of an insight how other people might kind of um, experience sort of the voices and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, obviously, like, it's... It's difficult for me to know how accurate that is, but mm. you know, working with with Eddie and Paul and people, like I think we've we've represented it in a in quite a faithful way. Um, so it's it's just those conversations, the back and forth conversations, to let me know if we're doing it faithfully, uh, respectfully. Yeah, um, um, it's is I want to say it again. It's not that. We want people to have to experience this, but I think the game gives you some insight in how it feels, the overwhelmingness of uh, how confusing it is when Senu is talking to people. Uh, if you, you might not know if the people you're speaking to can hear what you're hearing or not. It can be so loud and overwhelming sometimes. There's a particular voice in the game, one and two, that sounds... Something that happens with psychosis is sometimes it really feels like people can hear your thoughts, like your thoughts and feelings are leaking out of you. And um, with how the game is, it's, it's how similar some of the experiences are to what I've had. It feels like that, that must have happened uh, to be depicted in the game so accurately and so really and for it to feel the same way as it feels in real life. Um, <coughs> Uh, yeah, uh, there was something I wanted to pick up on, but I can't remember what it was. If we can go backwards, I'll remember it later. Uh, I'll remember <laughs> it later. No, well, thanks. I'll remember I mean, it later. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, if it comes back to you, just say. But in it, while we're waiting for other shows of hands, uh, there's some questions coming through on the chat. Um, well-spoken rambler from YouTube asks, how did the team find threading the needle between depicting the symptoms of psychosis Senna experiences where she's led on quests while making sure not to uh, go too far into, quote, video gamification? Mm. And I, I think this is a really interesting question. Yeah. So from my point of view, when I, when I used the word quest before, I, I meant it in quite an old-fashioned kind of chivalrous like romance sense in that it's a, a, a quest, a, a big important thing that Senoma feels like she has to accomplish or has to embark on, mm. as opposed to a kind of more video game definition of quest, which is it can be anything from something very trivial to something very, very important that you have to do. Um, I think for Senua in this game, everything she does comes from this quest that she's embarked upon that she feels she feels chosen to do and that she has promised mm. to the most important person to her to do um and everything falls out from there every every 
decision she makes and every action she takes, it might, the nature of the way she approaches that quest might change, but the actual quest that she's on does not change. Um, she never loses sight of that. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I don't know how the question's gone. <laughs> well, the, well, the question was, how do you avoid video gamification, yeah. which I read as being sort of turning it into a slightly more trivial yeah. Candy Crush type approach to <laughs> gaming? It's, I mean, honestly, it's really difficult. It's, it's really difficult finding that balance. Yeah. Because um, okay. we are making a game that players have to understand and, and kind of enjoy. Like, enjoy is a really weird term. Mm. Like, mm. we often don't say, like, um, during meetings, we always say we're not making a fun game. Like, this is an experience. Um, mm. So, yeah, finding that balance of of it being a piece of entertainment with kind of layering on, like, all those experiences is, is very tricky. Mm. Um, Are there any rules that you can sort of follow to <laughs> keep on straight and narrow? I mean, one of the key rules for us is, like, it shouldn't feel kind of frustrating to play. Like, we're trying to remove frustration. Like, you should be able to understand what you're, what you're doing as a player, right? Which we've made our lives so difficult for that because we've... Uh, it's one seamless journey, no camera cuts, no HUD, so we've got no button prompts coming up on screen. It's all you have to listen and look at the world you're in to understand what to do. And that makes it really hard because traditionally you just go big bu A button, press A to do thing. Mm. We're not doing that. Mm. Um, so yeah, that is that is tricky. Um, but I think it makes it a more rewarding experience yeah. because you're not being told what to do. You, the, you have to think about it a little bit more and, mm. and, and kind of figure it out without it being frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I must say, just to drop something, I, I find that aspect of the game really compelling and beautiful because it, it fits so well with what I think we're all doing all the time in the world. You know, we're not getting this drop-down display saying, use right hand to enter. Um, I think it's really important as part of the experience. Um, I'm going to ask another question. I would say to the people uh, presenting the text on the screen, it, it's sort of spilling off the end, so a smaller font would help, but I'm going to hazard a guess at this question, and it's um, Alex on Facebook asks, how would you recommend ga game developers go about finding professionals like yourself to collaborate with? It would be nice to see more of this happening in the industry. Thanks very much, whoever did that. Um, I suppose that's the sort of question I could begin with, because I'm a professional. Um, actually, Alex, I think it's not about finding the professionals. I think they're all out there. There's loads of them. We're a dime a dozen. Uh, there's nothing special about me at all. Um, I think what what really makes the collaboration. <laughs> Sorry, you're on, yeah, no, I was going to touch you. <laughs> I think what makes the collaboration work is the attitude that people bring into it, and that was very clear to me from the off when I went to meet with Dom and Tam. Um, was that it was a genuine desire to be honest and um, respectful in the portrayal, and I think as soon as you get that level of humility. Um, the collaboration is going to work as long as you bring a similar level of humility to it. And I think we've seen that in the discussion of, of collaborations. But, I mean, how, how should people find people to collaborate with? I'd lo love to. Millions of people experience psychosis in their lives. You know? I'm beyond lucky that I've been given this voice by Ninja Theory. Um, Recovery College is a really good place to uh, find people with lived experiences. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And can I actually turn to you, Matthew, because you're very collaborative and you mentioned some very powerful collaborations you set up. How do people find you? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've not worked with a, a game design company. I've worked with lots of um, humanities scholars and mm. theatre practitioners, and that's always been really interesting. Some of that, I think, as we were talking today, we've used work, for example, by Sarah Kane, Samuel Beckett, to try and teach... Um, medical students, neuroscientists about the experience of psychosis. So not quite the level you've done in, in Hellblade, but trying to use some other artistic media to try and, to, try and do that. And I think it's probably... Um, I think we have to think about how we portray ourselves as psychiatrists. Poor thing, sometimes people think we're a bit kind of standoffish and a bit severe and have a certain view of the world, very reductive by a medical world. But I think if we are open, as you did so wonderfully in your talk earlier, that we are aware that as a 
all these disciplines are really important in what we do. I think we're open to those discussions. And as you, I think your, your quote from was it, was it Chekhov showing how art and science were, were really important. I think showing that openness to our colleagues across, um, uh, I guess, the, the arts and across the humanities is, is really important. So a lot of it comes from me in those kind of ad hoc conversations or lots, almost like a semi-apology. I hope you don't mind bothering you, but I'm interested in X and people tell me you know something about this. Can we have a conversation? So that's how it kind of happens with me. And as I say, it can be with theatre practitioners or my humanities colleagues in Birmingham, yeah. I mean, I think just to add to that, uh, I would encourage anyone in science to becoming involved in these, this sort of activity. Um, there is always a danger that you become de facto the expert in the room, the one who says, you know, what's fact and what's fiction, what can be said and what can't. And I think you need to actively resist that. Um, in some situations, so that it actually does become a collaboration rather than you being a, a fact checker. Mm. Um, are there any questions in the room? We do have some on the chat. Oh, there's a couple here. So I'll take one, um, Sarah, and then I'll go to the chat and then we'll have Emmanuel. Yeah, so just out of interest, I wondered if this you feel will be the end of Senoa's journey in Hellblade 2, or do you ever envisage that there'll be another stage? further on that's one question and the other one is um really about whether this i mean psychosis obviously is a mental health challenge but there are many others that people experience and would this do you ever think about making a game that um reflects other experiences apart from psychosis have you thought about that or, well, it, uh, or, or getting yeah. the funding for it actually, <laughs> perhaps is the first question um, on the first question, I think all I'll say is at the moment we're just concentrating on yeah. making Hellblade 2 as good as it possibly can be and, and get that shipped. Yeah. Um, with regards to future projects, like we're kind of just very open in, in kind of discussion about what we would like to do next. Um, and you're, you're right, there's, there's so many subjects out there that you could base something on. Um, so, yeah, we never discount anything sort of based on a, a different kind of topic. Um, but right now, yeah. like, I can't really say yeah. Yeah, yeah, much more about yeah, what the future yeah, holds. I see so much scope um, for what you're doing. And yeah, yeah. I, I think there's a huge amount of scope, definitely. And, yeah, you know, not just us. Like, within the industry, there's, yeah. it's, it's such a good medium for this kind of, um, kind of narrative and, and storytelling and experience. Mm. Um, so I think... Yeah, I think it's, there's some untapped potential in the industry for this. Thank you. So before, Emmanuel, I'll just uh, raise this question. Erin from YouTube asks, if the world we see in the game is how Senua sees it and how her experience shapes it, then how should we interpret the depiction of Druth? Was he a real person or was he created in her mind? So for those who don't know, Druth is a sort of shadowy figure who tells Senua stories and gives her advice so the world that we see in the game is how Senua sees the world. So if Druth is real to Senua, then he is real to the player, real to, to us. Thank you. Yeah. Everything you see in the game is real to Senua. Emmanuel. Thank you. Um, clearly, this is a, a, su a success on multiple levels. What do people play the game um, feedback to you as to why they want to play the game why is it so su successful with players I think um, it might have been you Paul that touched on it earlier there's I th think people can emphasize uh, they can have empathy for the character right because they might see some part of them reflected in the character I think you know, that's that's a really good thing that games can do. If you kind of really build a, a strong character that, that has some sort of proper emotional levels to it, you you get that empathy. And, and I think there's a lot of people that really want those kind of stories within games. They don't just want to be running around, I don't know, jumping platforms or shooting people, right? There's, there's a different side of games that... Um, that can tell really strong stories and have strong characters um, that have something to say. Yeah, I would agree with that. Thank you. We um, have another question in the room over here. Oh, right. Yes. 
Thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you all for, for your time and for sharing everything. Um, I think this, this kind of goes back to a couple of questions ago when we looked at the video gamification of mental illness or of psychosis. Um, and I think it's something that we see quite a lot in potentially less thoughtful or less respectful uh, iterations. Um, or I guess in particular, I'm thinking of uh, like the quote unquote sanity meter that you find in a lot of games and how oftentimes, you know, like a game over state is uh, initiated by, you know, quote, going insane. Um, and, and thinking of, of when mental illness is used as a game mechanic like that, were there any things in particular that you chose to definitely avoid um, when it came to the representation that you use in the game? And what were the choices, I suppose, that you felt you wanted to stay away from, or even if there was anything that you tried initially and then realized you really wanted to walk that back? Uh, I'll let Mark chime in on this as well, but I think it, it goes back to that question about truth. Uh, we didn't want to have a, a sense of, of an objective world and a Senua's world and that you would have to detective your way through, through working out what was really going on. It's Senua's world that you see and her experiences that you share. So we, we did reject that, that kind of um, detective-y type mode, kind of trying to work out the real facts behind the case. We rejected that very early on. That was never a part of how we wanted to approach this. I think also, like, you really want to avoid going, oh, this is a psychosis moment. This is not a psychosis. Like, the whole experience is is one continuous thing. It's it's not kind of split like that. I think one of the other things we spoke about was making her not a superhero. Like, she's struggling through this, and we want the player to feel that struggle. Um, you know, she's she isn't using her powers to yeah. become a superhero. And I think that's so authentic yeah. and so, so yeah. important yeah. because it's, was it the Disneyfication? Was that mm. the word? And you don't want it full on gore either, but I think, you know, is it life gives you lemons, you make lemonade? It's like a bit cliche. Yeah. Whereas actually, as you say, she does have her challenges, um, yeah. but that's real life. That is yeah. how it is living with a long-term condition. Yeah. So I think it's so important that that's represented. Yeah. Mm. We're trying to show her perseverance, right? Her, yeah. her strength in character. Yeah. Um, that drives her forward. Yeah. 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 And another thing that was very important, I think, um, is that it's a combat game, um, and there's, there is violence, but the violence isn't and is never m m motivated by the psychotic experiences. You know, the violence is part of the quest, part of the defence. I would actually uh, change that. I don't think it is a combat game. I think oh, sorry. I think it's a game that has combat in it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> it's I, not a combat game. <laughs> I bow to your expertise. <laughs> it's important to be humble. <laughs> um, another question. Um, I was really interested in this kind of co-creation aspect. So I'd be really curious to hear about the lived experiences and how they like contributed to the narrative or the audio visual elements. So is there an example that you might be willing to give about something that you ended up changing or pushing further or drawing back as a result of this kind of co-creation process? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, actually we've got, got a clip of something we added relatively late on that is to do with um, kind of perspective and seeing things in the world that might not be there, but could be there. Um, I think the clip's called Hidden Face. If you can get that up. This is an interesting thing. Can you see it? There, the light. Look, look. towards it. Look, over there. What can you see? Something different. What is it? Look. Right. Face. Face. Oh, so beautiful. They're moving. Moving. Transforming. Where will it take you? Where? So I think that that was an example of something that 
kind of came from the conversations about kind of seeing things in the world that you definitely think are there, but when you kind of look at it on sort of closer inspection, it actually reveals itself to be something else. You don't know that hallucinations are hallucinations sometimes. Um, uh, nudge me if I go on a tangent okay, here. Yeah. But, um, I never knew that what was happening to me was a medical thing or a, a, um, a, a psychological thing. I thought it was a mystical thing, a, a spiritual thing, a religious thing, or just something that I couldn't explain. Uh, Senua lives before psychology as we know it and might not know that what is happening is a psych... Uh, she yeah, it's just very difficult to know that uh, hallucinations are hallucinations when you're when they're happening. Um, where she is impacts the, uh, the the folklore of where she is 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 a part of is part of uh, what she's experiencing. Um, yeah, and that's and that certainly reflects my experiences. Uh, uh, yeah, and and another thing that we've talked about is sometimes these experiences can be quite beautiful or feel very 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 meaningful to you. We said that everything that happens in the game is 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 through Senua, through Senua's, uh, and uh, it, it can be a lot like that sometimes. It can mm -hmm. you, it, things can feel very significant to you. Yeah. Uh, it, it might be what it says on the side of a uh, lorry. Yeah. It might be someone's name when you meet them. Can can feel like it's 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 about more than than what it seems. Um, I think yeah. in the case of Senua as well, like as you were saying in in your talk, Paul, like all of her preconceptions, stories she's been told, have an influence on how she then perceives everything. Mm. And it might be an element of one of those stories that leads her to to follow a particular pattern or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, and I think all of these things are ways in which the game has been sculpted by experience. And, uh, you know, the example of things being beautiful is very important because I think originally there was a lot of darkness, but it was actually one of the people involved early in the first game who said, well, hang on, you know, it's not all dark. There's some very lovely experiences, and that was really acted upon. Yeah, my see. Just to bring on, take forward Eddie's point, and I think when we talk to young people with psychosis, like what they will say is making sense of the experience, and they will draw on, as Eddie said, the sort of cultural resources out there. So not only what they've been taught, but also what, what's around, and they will do the same things you or I would do. If something strange is happening, they'll look on the internet, they'll read books, they'll ask their friends. Mm. So these experiences get elaborated in, 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 in quite in very varied ways. And I guess with the character here, she has a kind of mystical or religious tradition to draw on, but some of our patients then enter into a world that becomes more... Um, I, I get quite jealous, actually, sort of metaphysically rich. You were saying how you met people who were, who were mythical or biblical characters and yep. notions of causality change and uh, a, a very different world can be lived along, alongside. But if there's a kind of meaning-making that goes on. It's not kind of, um, uh, what do you say, a, a brute sort of brain event that occurs and gives you meaning fully formed. Meaning is generated by, by the person who has the experience. Mm. Yeah. There's a hand up here. I think we have one question here. And then oh, beg your pardon. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. Hey, um, so obviously perception of reality is a very nuanced and complicated subject and a lot of it I'm learning for the first time today. Um, but my general understanding is that there are sort of, there, are, there is a reality, a perception of reality that more people um, are perceiving and then there's Senua's, what Senua's perception is. In terms of design, do you, do you start with what, uh, for example, you would perceive and then decide what Senua's perception of that would be? Or do you start with Senua's perception and work backwards? That's a really good question, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think it's a mix of both. So in the example of, of taking our setting, like um, we kind of purposely picked Iceland for a number of reasons. One, during the time period, there was a lot of 
different cultures sort of landing on their settling on there. So that was interesting from a story point of view of how would those different cultures clash those different ideas. Um, so, so in that sense, you kind of start with Senua's perception of those other characters of, of the world. But then on the flip side, you take one of the areas in Iceland and like it could be the most barren, hospitable thing like you've ever seen. And so you then take that back and go, OK, if Senna was here for the first time seeing this, she's never seen rock formations like this. How would her sort of experiences then kind of change that? So I, I think it's it's a difficult, yeah, it's a mix of, of both. Like you have a, a sort of an idea of the story, but then you build on on kind of where she is in, in the levels as well. Um, and now that there are people, did that process change from the first game to the second game? It didn't work on that. Uh, so, um, yes, in an extent. So I guess um, what was different about this is we knew that Senna was going to be having kind of conversations with these people. It's not just internal. So from that point of view, we absolutely started with what those conversations were going to be. And then that's when we kind of think about sort of how her voices would react to that conversation. Um, so I think a lot of the time when you shot the scenes, you kind of, you sort of spaced it out enough. We so left, yeah we, yeah, we left space for the, for the Furies to make their contribution to that. Yeah. Um, it was also important for us to to give the other characters opportunities for noticing that Senua does see the world differently. Mm. Um, so we did that, and then we thought about how each of them might react to that fact and how they would see her differently according to who they were and what their situation was, and then how would they respond, and then how would Senua respond to that, <laughs> so on for the entirety of the script. Mm -hmm. So I'm mindful that we only really have one minute. I saw a hand up here. While the microphone's going to you, I'll just quickly allude to a question from a viewer on Twitch who asks, we saw a couple of examples using sensors like visual and audio. What about the possibility of deception of reality with touch or smell? Mm -hmm. um, I, I can perhaps speak to that very quickly. Obviously, in the context of the game, um, you have a minimum amount to which you can create touch, apart from through the sort of rumble of the handheld controller. Smell's not a... Not yet a well, yes, possibility. Option. But in real life, of course, smell will determine what you're expecting and can actually influence the way in which you perceive things. So in binocular rivalry, if one eye sees a rose and the other sees a felt-tip pen, if you pervade the room with the smell of a rose, the person is much more likely to be seeing the rose uh, rather than the pen. So smell has an impact. So final question and then we'll stop. Amazing. Um, thanks, everybody. It's been incredible uh, listening to your perspectives. Um, uh, I had a question mainly for Lara and Mark, um, which was around um, sort of how it's impacted your practice um, and also Ninja Theory as a company. Um, it's clearly impacted everybody significantly, this collaboration, in, in many ways. And I was just interested to understand, I think somebody touched on uh, the kind of pervading tropes within within the games industry, and that's not um, so only around um, mental health, but gender, race. Um, you know, there's serious um, uh, inequality and issues um, with, with with the sort of tropes that are used. So I was just really interested to know if if this has had a sort of a wider and lasting effect. This experience for for you as a company, for you as creatives. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I think kind of we're a studio that um, likes to take sort of some sort of creative risks and do things a, a little differently. I think um, Paul mentioned a couple of other titles um, that have done some really awesome stuff. I think we have this very kind of independent nature to us in that we want to explore different things, um, different ideas. So I think, you know, kind of working on on these games has kind of opened our eyes a lot to how games can be different. Like the um, the experiences that you can tell uh, don't have to be exactly the same as you know games that 
have been going on for decades. Like there is an opportunity to do something different. And I think as a studio, we creatively really want to pursue kind of, I don't know, yes, really interesting avenues. Um, and yeah. I think that because this collaboration has been such a, a great experience for us and so valuable, I don't see us ever approaching things differently in the future if there's mm. if there's uh, a group of people that we will need to speak to to understand to get insight to and to be able to accurately reflect experiences of we will re reach out mm. Thanks. No, I'm sorry we're going to have to leave it there so I, I um, Dom will have a few words to say and also we'll be showing um, a very powerful five minute video at the end which would be great if you could stay around for but before that I, I think you've been an absolutely fantastic panel thank you so much perhaps you join me in thanking Emma and Eddie Mark Lara and Matthew thank you So, yes, thank you to everyone. Thank you to all of our panellists um, for speaking so um, openly and at times so bravely about their experiences. Um, uh, and thank you for everyone joining us today. And thank you to all of our collaborators um, on, on the Hellblade Games. Um, it is the collaboration, as, you, as you've heard, that has made all the difference in the stories that we can tell uh, for our players. So I hope you've t uh, enjoyed today's discussions. And it's given you a bit of an insight into the collaboration behind um, Hellblade Senua Sacrifice and Senua Saga Hellblade 2. As Paul mentioned, and as I mentioned earlier, the most uh, valuable and impactful outcome of Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice for us as creators was certainly the impact that it had on our players. So to close today, we'd like to share with you some of the really wonderful messages that we received uh, from our fans and from our players. So thank you 